All right. We are starting a new series of reading here tonight for you on the show. This is Zachariah Sitchin's The End of Days, Armageddon, and Prophecies of the Return. The seventh and concluding book of the Earth Chronicles. And again, I do not... Uh, not endorsing this or saying I believe in it. I am uh, refer you to my spiel at the beginning of the show tonight. Preface, the past, the future. When will they return? I've been asked this question countless times by people who have read my books. The they being the Anunnaki, the extraterrestrials who have come to Earth from their planet Nibiru and who were revered in antiquity as gods. Will it be when Nibiru and its elongated orbit returns to our vicinity, and what will happen then? Will, will there be darkness at noon, and the earth shall shatter? Will it be peace on earth or Armageddon? A millennium of trouble and tri tribulations, or a messianic second coming? Will it happen in 2012 or later, or not at all? These are profound questions that combine people's deepest hopes and anxieties with religious beliefs and expectations. Questions compounded by current events, wars, and lands where the entwined affairs of gods and men began, the threats of nuclear holocausts, the alarming ferocity of natural disasters. They are questions that I dared not answer all these years, but now are questions the answers to which must not be delayed. Questions about the return. It ought to be realized are not new. They have inexorably been linked to the past as they are today to the expectation and the apprehension of the day of the Lord, the end of days, Armageddon. Four millennia ago, the Near East witnessed a God and his son promising heaven on earth. More than three millennia ago, king and people in Egypt yearned for a messianic time. Two millennia ago, the people of Judea wondered whether the Messiah had appeared and we are still seized with the mysteries of those events. Are prophecies coming true? We shall deal with the puzzling answers that were given, solve ancient enigmas, decipher the origin and meanings of symbols, the cross, the fishes, the chalice. We shall describe the role of space-related sites in historic events and show why past, present, and future converge in Jerusalem, the place of the bond of heaven and earth. And we shall ponder why it is that our current 21st century A.D. is so similar to the 21st century B.C.E. Is history repeating itself? Is it destined to repeat itself? Is it all guided by a messianic clock? Is the time at hand? More than two millennia ago, Daniel of Old Testament fame repeatedly asked the angels when. When will be the end of days, the end of time? More than three centuries ago, the famed Sir Isaac Newton was who elicited the secrets of celestial moons, composed treatises on the Old Testament's book of Daniel and the New Testament's book of Revelation. His recently found handwritten calculations concerning the end of days will be analyzed, along with more recent predictions of the end. Both the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament asserted that the secrets of the future are embedded in the past that the destiny of earth is connected to the heavens, that the affairs of, and fate of mankind are linked to those of God and gods. In dealing with what is yet to happen, we cross over from history to prophecy. One cannot be understood without the other, and we shall report them both. With that as our guide, let us look at what is to come through the lens of what has had, what had been. The answers will be certain to surprise. And that was the introduction there. Zachariah Sitch in New York, November 2006. Chapter number one, The Messianic Clock. Wherever one turns, humankind appears seized with apocalyptic trepidation, messianic fervor, and end-time anxiety. Religious fanaticism manifests itself in wars, rebellions, and the slaughter of infidels. Armies amassed by kings of the West are warring with armies of the kings of the East. 
A clash of civilization shakes the foundations of traditional ways of life. Carnage engulfs cities and towns. The high and the mighty seek safety behind protective walls. Natural calamities and ever-intensifying catastrophes leave people wondering. Has mankind sinned? Is it witnessing divine wrath? Is it due for another annihilating deluge? Is this the apocalypse? Can there be, will there be salvation? Are messianic times afoot? The, the time, the 21st century AD, or was it the 21st century BCE? The answer, it, correct, is yes and yes. Both in our own time as well as in those ancient times, it is the condition of the present time as well as at a time more than four millennia ago. And the amazing similarity is due to events in the middle time in between, the period associated with the messianic fervor at the time of Jesus. Those three cataclysmic periods for mankind and its planet, two in the recorded past, circa 2100 BCE and when BCE changed to AD, one in the nearing future are interconnected. One has led to the other. One can be understood only by understanding the other. The present stems from the past. The past is the future. Essential to all three is messianic expectation. And linking all three is prophecy. How the present time of troubles and tribulations will end, what the future portends, requires entering the realm of prophecy. Ours will not be a melange of newfound predictions whose main magnet is fear and of doom and end, but a reliance upon unique ancient records that documented the past, predicted the future, and recorded previous messianic expectations, prophesizing the future in antiquity, and one believes the future that is to come. In all three apocalyptic instances, the two that had occurred, the one that is about to happen, the physical and spiritual relationship between heaven and earth was and remains pivotal for the events. The physical aspects were expressed by the existence on earth of actual sites that linked earth with the heavens. Sites that were deemed crucial, that were focuses of the events. The spiritual aspects have been expressed in what we call religion. In all three instances, a changed relationship between man and God was central except that when circa 2100 BCE, mankind faced the first of these three apocal uh, upheavals. The relationship was between men and gods, in the plural, meaning more than one. Whether that relationship has really changed, the reader will soon discover. The story of the gods, the Anunnaki, those who from heaven to earth came, as the Sumerians called them, begins with their coming to earth from Nibiru in need of gold. The story of their planet was told in antiquity in the Epic of Creation, a long text on seven tablets. It is usually considered to be an allegorical myth, the product of primitive minds that spoke of planets as living gods combating each other. But as I have shown in my book, The Twelfth Planet, the ancient text is in fact a sophisticated cosmology that tells how a stray planet passing by our solar system collided with a planet called Tiamat. The collision resulted in the creation of Earth and its moon, of the asteroid belt and comets, and in the capture of the invader itself in a great elliptical orbit that takes about 3,600 years to complete. And, uh, yeah, maybe that's the, that's the whole uh, basis of, of Sitchin's work. Uh, uh, again, my why he never talked about Vulcan is just a big question for me. Vulcan actually uh, said to have more of these effects. I don't know. I just I, I'm I'm down with the Sumerian stuff. I'm just not down with the whole Nibiru thing. I, don't, I just don't believe in it. Uh, it was Sumerian texts tell 120 such orbits, 432 thousand Earth years prior to the deluge, the great flood that the Anunnaki came to Earth. How and why they came their first cities in the Eden, the biblical Eden, their fashioning of the atom and the reasons for it, and the events of the catastrophic deluge have all been told in the Earth Chronicle series of my books and will not be repeated here. 
But before we time travel to the momentous 21st century BCE, some pre-diluvial and post-diluvial landmark events need to be recalled. The biblical tale of the deluge, starting in chapter 6 of Genesis, describes its conflicting aspects to a sole deity, Yahweh, who at first is determined to wipe mankind off the face of the earth, and then goes out of his way to save it through Noah and the ark. Well, that's, yeah, that Yahweh is a common, they're, they're combining, uh, it's like it's like they're combining Enlil and, and, and Enki together into one into one thing because of course Enki created mankind and felt com- had compassion for them. Enlil wanted them wiped out, and uh, Enki had compassion and created the ark and saved them. The earlier Sumerian sources of the tale ascribe the disaffection with mankind to the god Enlil, and the counter effort to save mankind to the god Enki. What the Bible glossed over for the sake of monotheism was not just the disagreement between Enlil and Enki, but a rivalry and a conflict between two clans of Anunnaki that dominated the course of subsequent events on Earth. The conflict between the two and their offspring and the Earth religions allocated to them after the deluge need to be kept in mind to understand all that happened thereafter. The two were half-brothers, sons of Nibiru's ruler Anu. Their conflict on Earth had its roots on their home planet, Nibiru. Enki, then called Ea, whose home, he whose home is water, or, yeah, that's exactly, well, that's what our, most of our planet's made of. That's why Earth, E-A-R-T-H, the realm of Ea, that's what the Earth means. Was Anu's firstborn son, but not the official spouse, Antu. When Enlil was born to Anu by Antu, a half-sister of Anu, Enlil became the legal heir to Nibiru's throne, though he was not the firstborn son. The unavoidable resentment on the part of Enki and his maternal family was exacerbated by the fact that Anu's accession to the throne was problematic to begin with. Having lost out in a succession struggle to a rival named Alalu, He later usurped the throne in a coup d'etat, forcing Alalu to flee Nibiru for his life. That not only backtracked Ea's resentments to the days of his forebears, but also brought about other challenges to the leadership of Enlil, as told in the epic tale of Anzu. For the tangled relationships of Nibiru's royal families and the ancestries of Anu and Antu, Enlil and Ea see the lost book of Enki, or better yet, listen to my reading of it on YouTube. The key to unlocking the mystery of the gods' succession in marriage rules was my realization that these rules also applied to the people chosen by them to serve as their proxies to mankind. Well, yep, that's, that's where the bloodlines come in. It was the biblical tale of the patriarch Abraham in Genesis 20.12. Isn't that interesting? Genesis 20.12. The book of Genesis chapter... 20 verse 12 that he did not lie when he had presented his wife Sarah as his sister indeed she is my sister the daughter of my father but not the daughter of my mother and she became my wife not only was marrying a half sister from a different mother permitted but a son by her in this case Isaac became the first legal heir and dynastic successor rather than the firstborn Ishmael, the son of a handmaiden of the handmaiden Hagar. How such succession rules caused the bitter feud between Ra's divine descendants in Egypt, the half-brothers Osiris and Seth, who married the half-sisters Isis and Nephetus, is explained in the Wars of Gods and Men. Though those succession rules appear complex, they were based on those who write about royal dynasties and, and what then I'm sorry. They were based on what those who write about royal dynasties call bloodlines. What we now should recognize as sophisticated DNA genealogies that also distinguish between general DNA inherited from the parents as well as the mitochondrial DNA that is inherited by females only from the mother. The complex yet basic rule was this. Dynastic lines continue through the male line. The firstborn son is the next in succession. A half-sister could be taken as a wife if she had a different mother, and if a son by such a half-sister is later born, 
That son, though not firstborn, becomes the legal heir and the dynastic successor. The rivalry between the two half-brothers, Yia and Enki and Enlil, in matters of the throne was complicated by personal rivalry in matters of the heart. They both coveted their half-sister Ninma, whose mother was yet another concubine of Anu. She was Yia's true love, but he was not permitted to marry her. Enlil then took over and had a son by her, Ninurta. Though born without wedlock, the secession rules made Ninurta Enlil's uncontested heir, being both the, his firstborn son and one born by a royal half-sister. Ea, as related in the Earth Chronicles book, was the leader of the first group of 50 Anunnaki to come to Earth to obtain the gold needed to protect Nibiru's dwindling atmosphere. When the initial plans failed, his half-brother Enlil was sent to Earth with more Anunnaki for an expanded mission. If that was not enough to create a hostile atmosphere, Ninma too arrived on Earth to serve as chief medical officer. A long text known as the Atreus' Epic begins the story of gods and men on Earth with a visit by Anu to Earth to settle once and for all, he hoped, the rivalry between his two sons, and that was ruining the final mission. He even offered to stay on Earth and let one of the half-brothers assume the regency on Nibiru. With that in mind, the ancient texts tell us lots were drawn to determine who would stay on Earth and who would sit on Nibiru's throne. The result of drawing lots, then, was that Anu returned to Nibiru as its king, Ea, given dominion over the seas and waters. In later times, Ea was known as Poseidon to the Greeks and Neptune to the Romans. He was granted the epitaph Enki, the lord of the earth, to soothe his feelings, but it was Enlil, lord of the command, who was put in overall charge. To him, the earth was made subject, resentful or not, Ea and Enki could not defy the rules of secession or the results of the drawing of lots. And so the resentment, the anger at justice denied, and a consuming determination to avenge injustices to his father and forefathers, and thus to himself, led Enki's son Marduk to take up the fight. Several texts describe how the Anunnaki set up their settlements in the Eden, the post-diluvial Sumer, each with a specific function and all laid out in accordance with a master plan. The crucial space connection, the ability to constantly stay in communication with the home planet and with the shuttlecraft and spacecraft, was maintained from Enlil's command post in Nippur, the heart of which was a dimly lit chamber called the Duranki, the bond of heaven and earth. Yeah, the bond of it, that's a, that's a stargate. Another vital facility was a spaceport located at Sipar, the bird city. Yeah, where they land their fucking Klingon bird of praise at. tick tock so. Nippur lay at the center of concentric circles with each other, where the cities of the gods were located. Altogether, they shaped out for an arriving spacecraft, a landing corridor whose focal point was the Near East's most visible topographic feature, the twin peaks of Mount Ararat. And then the deluge swept over the Earth, obliterated all the cities of the gods with their mission control center and spaceport, and buried the Eden under millions of tons of mud and silt. Everything had to be done all over again, but much could no longer be the same. First and foremost, it was necessary to create a new spaceport, spaceport facility with a new mission control center and new beacon sites for a landing corridor. The new landing path was anchored again on the prominent twin peaks of Ararat. The other components were all new. The actual spaceport in the Sinai Peninsula on the 30th parallel north artificial twin beacon peaks as beacon sites, the Giza pyramids, and a new mission control center at a place called Jerusalem. It was a layout that played a crucial ro role in post-diluvial events. The deluge was a watershed in the affairs of both gods and men, and in the relationship between the two. The earthlings who were fashioned to serve and work for the gods were henceforth treated as junior partners on a devastated planet. The new relationship between men and gods was formulated, sanctified, and codified when mankind was granted its first high civilization in Mesopotamia circa 3800 BCE. The momentous event followed a state visit to Earth by Anu, not just as Nibiru's ruler, but also as the head of the pantheon on Earth. 
of the ancient gods. Another and probably the main reason for his visit was the establishment and affirmation of peace among the gods themselves, a live and let live arrangement dividing the lands of the old world among the two principal Anunnaki clans, that of Enlil and that of Enki for the new post-alluvial circumstances and the new location of the space facilities required a new territorial division among the gods. It was a division that was reflected in the biblical table of nations, Genesis chapter 10, in which the spread of mankind emanating from the three sons of Noah was recorded by nationality and geography. Asia to the nations, lands of Shem, Europe to the descendants of Japhet, Africa to the nation and lands of Ham. The historical records show that the parallel division among the gods allotted the first two to the Enlilites, the third one to Enki and his sons. The connecting Sinai Peninsula, where the vital post-alluvial spaceport was located, was set aside as a, as a neutral sacred region. And uh, that's the reason why those are considered the, the, the you know, the, the holy lands and stuff, folks. That's where the fucking aliens landed. Come on. While the Bible simply listed the lands and nations according to their Noahite division, the earlier Sumerian text recorded the fact that the division was a deliberate act. The results of deliberations by the leadership of the Anunnaki, a text known as the Epic of Atana, tells us that the great Anunnaki who decree the fates sat exchanging their counsels regarding the earth. They created the four regions and set up the settlements. In the first region, the land between the two rivers, Euphrates and the Tigris, Mesopotamia, man's first known high civilization, that of Samir, was established. Where the pre-diluvial cities of the gods had been, cities of man arose, each with its sacred precinct where a deity resided in his or her ziggurat. In Lil, in Dapur, Ninma, in Shiparak, Ninurta, in Lagash, then our sin in Ur, so on and so on, in each such urban center, an Ensi, a righteous shepherd, initially a chosen demigod, was selected to govern the people in behalf of the gods. His main assignment was to promulgate codes of justice and morality in the sacred precinct, a priesthood overseen by a high priest served the god and his spouse supervised the holiday celebrations and handled the rites of offerings, sacrifices, and prayers to the gods. Art and sculpture, music and dance, poetry and hymns, and above all, writing and record-keeping flourished in the temples and extended to the royal place. Uh, the royal palace, rather. From time to time, one of those cities was selected to serve as the land's capital. There the ruler was king, Lugal, the great man. Initially, and for a long time thereafter, this person, the most powerful man in the land, served as both king and high priest. He was carefully chosen for his role and authority, and all the physical symbols of kingship were deemed to have come to earth directly from heaven, from a new on a Nibiru. A Sumerian text dealing with the subject stated that before the symbols of kingship, the tiara, the crown, and the scepter, and of righteousness, the shepherd's staff, were granted to an earthly king, they lay deposited before Anu in heaven. Indeed, the Sumerian word for kingship was Anu ship. The aspect of kingship as the essence of civilization, just behavior and a moral code for mankind, was explicitly expressed in the statement in the Sumerian king list that after the deluge, kingship was brought down from heaven. It was a profound statement that must be borne in mind as we progress in this book to the messianic expectations in the words of the New Testament for the return of the kingship of heaven to earth. Let's get into the end of days now. We're picking up where we left off last night. Circa 3100 BCE, a similar yet not identical civilization was established in the second region in Africa that of the river Nile, Nubia, in Egypt. Its history was not as harmonious as that of the Enlilites, for rivalry and contention continued among Enki's six sons, to whom not cities but whole land domains were allocated. Paramount was an ongoing conflict between Enki's firstborn, Mar Marduk, 
also known as Ra in Egypt and Ningizida Toth in Egypt, a conflict that led to the exile of both Toth and a band of African followers to the New World, where he became known as Quetzalcoatl, the Winged Serpent. And uh, that's, see, that's what, where my uh, research has taken me on the rock wall thing. Because that's what it appears that, uh, or that, that's what it appears this time period in which the rock wall was uh, created was that time period in which Toth and his band of African followers came to the New World. And when he became known as Quetzalcoatl, the Winged Serpent. Marduk Ra himself was punished and exiled when opposing the marriage of his young brother Demuzi to Enlil's granddaughter, Inanna and Ishtar. He caused his brother's death. It was as compensation to Inanna Ishtar that she was granted dominion over the third region of civilization, that of the Indus Valley, circa 2900 BCE. It was for good reason that the three civilizations as was the spaceport in the sacred region, were all centered on the 30th parallel north. According to Sumerian texts, the Anunnaki established kingship, civilization, and its institutions, as most clearly exemplified in Mesopotamia, as a new order in their relationships with mankind, with kings, priests, serving both as as a link and a separator between gods and men. But as one looks back on that seemingly golden age, In the affairs of gods and men, it becomes evident that the affairs of gods constantly dominated and determined the affairs of men and the fate of mankind. Overshadowing all was the determination of Marduk, or Ra, to to undo the the injustice done to his father, Ea, Enki. When under the secession rules of the Anunnaki, not Enki, but Enlil, was declared the legal heir of their father, Anu, the ruler on their home planet, Nibiru. And according with the sexagesimal mathematical system that the gods granted the Sumerians, the 12 great gods of the Sumerian pantheon were given numerical rank in which Anu held the supreme rank of 60. The rank of 50 was granted to Enlil, that of Enki was 40, and so farther down, alternating between male and female deities. Under the secession rules, Enlil's son Nerta was in line for the rank of 50 on Earth. When Marduk held a nominal rank of 10, and initially these two successors in waiting were not yet part of the 12 Olympians. And so the long, bitter, and relentless struggle by Marduk that began with Enlil in Enki feud focused later on Marduk's contention with Enlil's son Ninurta for the succession to the rank of 50, and it extended to Enlil's granddaughter, who was Inanna and also known as Ishtar, whose marriage to Demuzi, Enki's youngest son, was so opposed by Marduk that it ended with Demuzi's death. In time, Marduk faced conflicts even with other brothers and half-brothers of his, in addition to the conflict with Toth that we've already mentioned, principally with Enki's son Nurgle, who married a granddaughter of Enlil named Ereshkigal. In the course of these struggles, the conflicts at times flared up to full-fledged wars between the two divine clans. Some of these wars are called the Pyramid Wars in my book, The Wars of Gods and Men. In one notable instance, the fighting led to the burying alive of Marduk inside the Great Pyramid. In another, it led to its capture by Ninurta. Marduk was also exiled more than once, both as a punishment and a self-imposed absence. His persistent efforts to attain the status to which he believed he was entitled included the event recorded in the Bible as the Tower of Babel incident. But in the end, after numerous frustrations, success came only when heaven and earth were aligned with the messianic clock. Indeed, the first cataclysmic set of events of the 21st century BCE and the messianic expectations that accompanied it is principally the story of Marduk that also brought to center, center stage his son Nabu, a deity, the son of a god, but whose mother was an earthling. Throughout the history of Sumer that spanned almost 2,000 years, its royal capital shifted from the first one, Kish, Ninurta's first city, to Uruk, the city that Anu granted to Inanna and Ishtar, to Ur, Sin's seat of center and worship, then to others and then back to the initial ones. Finally, for the third time, back to Ur, 
but all but at all times in Little City Nippur, his cult center, as scholars won't call it, remained the religious center of Sumer and Sumerian people. It was there that the annual cycle of worshiping the gods was determined. The twelve Olympians of the Sumerian pantheon, each with his or her celestial counterpart among the twelve members of the solar system, the sun, the moon, and ten planets, including Nibiru, were also honored with one month each in the annual cycle of the twelve-month year. The Sumerian term for month, Ezen, actually means holiday, festival, and each such month was devoted to celebrating the worship festival of one of the twelve supreme gods. It was the need to determine the exact time when each such month began and ended not in order to enable peasants to know when to sow or harvest, as school books explain, that led to the introduction of mankind's first calendar in 3760 BCE. It is known as the Calendar of Nippur because it was the task of its priests to determine the calendar intricate timetables to announce for the whole land the time of the religious festivals. The calendar is still in use to this day as the Jewish religious calendar, which in AD 2007 numbers the year in pre-diluvial times, Nippur served as mission control center. In Lil's command post where he set up the Duran Key, the bond of heaven and earth for communications with the home planet, Nibiru, and with the spacecraft connecting them, after the deluge, These functions were relocated to a place later known as Jerusalem. Its center position, equidistant from the other functional centers in the Eden, were also deemed to be equidistant from the four corners of the earth and gave it the nickname Navel of the Earth, a hymn to Enlil referred to Nippur and its functions thus as this. Enlil, when you marked off divine settlements on earth, Nippur you set up as your very own city. You founded the Duran Key in the center of the four corners of the earth. The term the four corners of the earth is also found in the Bible. And when Jerusalem replaced Nippur as mission control center after the deluge, it too was nicknamed the navel of the earth. In Sumerian, the term for the four regions of the earth was Ub. But it was also found as Anub, the heavenly, the celestial four corners. In this case, an astronomical term connected with the calendar. It is taken to refer to the four points in the Earth-Sun cycle and the annual cycle that we nowadays call the summer solstice, the winter solstice, and the two crossings of the equator. One as the spring equinox and then as the autumnal equinox. In the calendar of Nippur, the year began on the day of the spring equinox and it has so remained in the ensuing calendars of the ancient Near East. That determined the time of the most important festival of the year, the New Year Festival, an event that lasted 10 days during which detailed and canonized rituals had to be followed. Determining calendrical time by heliacal rising entitled the observation of the skies at dawn. When the sun just begins to rise on the eastern horizon, but the skies are still dark enough to show the stars in the background, The day of the equinox having been determined by the fact that on it, daylight and nighttime were precisely equal. The position of the sun at the heliacal rising was then marked by the erection of a stone pillar to guide future observations. A procedure that was followed, for example, later on at Stonehenge in Britain. And as at Stonehenge, long-term observations revealed that the group of stars or constellations in the background has not remained the same there. The alignment stone called the, the back, though the background stayed the same, there the alignment stone called the heel stone that points to a sunrise on solstice nowadays pointed originally to a sunrise circa 2000 BCE. The phenomenon called the precession of the equinoxes, or just precession, results from the fact that as the Earth completes one annual orbit around the sun, it does not return to the same exact celestial spot. There is a slight, very slight retardation. It amounts to one degree out of 360 in the circle in 72 years. It was Enki who first grouped the stars observable from Earth into constellations and divided the heavens in which the Earth circled the sun into 12 parts. What has since been called the zodiacal circle of constellations, since each 12th part of the circle occupied 30 degrees of the celestial arc, 
The retardation or processional shift from one zodiacal house to another lasted mathematically 2,160 years, 72 times 30. And a complete zodiacal cycle lasted 25,920 years, 2,160 times 12. The approximate dates of the zodiacal ages following the equal 12-part division and not actual astronomical observations have been added here for the reader's guidance. Guana, the heavenly bull, Taurus, Mashtaba, the twins, or Gemini. Dub, the pincers, the tongues, is the crab of cancer. Ergula, the lion, which we call Leo. Absin, her father was Sin, the maiden, Virgo. Zibaana, the heavenly fate, the scales of Libra. Gertab, which claws and cuts, the Scorpio. Pabil, the defender, the archer, Sagittarius. Shermash, the goatfish, Capricorn. Gu, the lord of the waters, the water bearer, Aquarius. Sima, fishes, Pisces. Kumal, the field dweller, the ram, Aries. That this was the achievement from a time preceding mankind's civilizations is attested by the fact that a zodiacal calendar was applied to Inky's first stays on Earth when the first two zodiacal houses were named in his honor. That this was not the achievement of a Greek astronomer in the 3rd century BCE, as most textbooks will suggest, is attested by the fact that the 12 zodiacal houses were known to the Sumerians millennia earlier by names and depictions that we use to this day. In When Time Began, the calendrical timetables of gods and men were discussed at length. Having come from Nibiru, whose orbital period, the Sar, the, the Shar, meant 3,600 Earth years. That unit was naturally the first calendrical yardstick of the Anunnaki, even on the fast-orbiting Earth. Indeed, the texts dealing with their early days on Earth, such as the Sumerian king lists, designated the periods of this or that leader's time on Earth in terms of shars. I termed this divine time. The calendar granted in mankind, one based on the orbital aspects of the Earth, and its moon was named earthly time, pointing out that the 2,160-year zodiacal shift, less than a year for the Anunnaki, offered them a better ratio, the golden ratio of 10 to 6 between the two extremes. I called this celestial time. As Marduk discovered that celestial time was the clock by which his destiny was to be determined but which was mankind's messianic clock determining its fate and destiny, earthly time, such as the count of 50-year jubilees, a count in centuries, or the millennium. Was it divine time geared to Nibiru's orbit, or was it, is it, celestial time that follows slow rotation of the zodiacal clock? The quandary, as we shall see, baffled mankind in antiquity. It still lies at the core of the current return issue. The question that is posed has been asked before by Babylonian and Assyrian stargazing priests, by biblical prophets in the book of Daniel, in Revelation of St. John the Divine, by the likes of Sir Isaac Newton, by all of us today. The answer will be astounding, but let us embark on the painstaking quest. And uh, that's the end of chapter one. Let me get a drink here. And uh, we're going to get into a little chapter two for you here now. And it came to pass the end of days by Zachariah Sitchin. It is highly significant that in its record of Sumer and the early Sumerian civilization, the Bible chose to highlight the space connection incident, the one known as the tale of the Tower of Babel. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shanir, and they settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them by the fire. And the bricks served them as stone. And the bitumen served them as mortar. And they said, Come, let us build a city and a tower whose head shall reach the heavens. Genesis 11, 2-4. This is how the Bible recorded the most audacious attempt by Marduk to assert his supremacy and by establishing his own city in the heart of Enlilite domains and, moreover, 
to build there his own space facility with its own launch tower. The place is named in the Bible Babel, Babylon in English. This biblical tale is remarkable in many ways. It records, for first of all, the settlement of the Tigris of the Euphrates plain after the deluge, after the soil had dried up enough to permit resettlement. It correctly names the new land Shinar, the Hebrew name for Sumer. It provides the important clue from where, from the mountainous regions to the east, the settlers had come. It recognizes that it was there that man's first urban civilization began, the building of cities. It correctly notes and explains that in that land, where the soil consisted of layers of dried mud and there is no native rock, the people used mud bricks for building and by hardening the bricks in kilns could use them instead of stone. It also refers to the use of bitumen as a natural petroleum product seeped up from the ground in southern Mesopotamia but was totally absent in the land of Israel. The authors of this chapter in Genesis were thus well informed regarding the origins and the key innovations of the Sumerian civilization. They also recognized the significance of the Tower of Babel incident, as in the tales of the creation of Adam in the, del- of the deluge, they melded the various Sumerian deities into the plural Elohim, or into an all-encompassing and supreme Yahweh. But they left us in the tale the fact that it took a group of deities to say, let us come down and put an end to this rogue effort. Sumerian and later Babylonian records attest to the veracity of the biblical tale and contain many more details linking the incident to the overall strained relationship between the gods that caused the outbreak of two pyramid wars after the deluge. The peace on earth arrangement circa 8650 BCE left the erstwhile Eden in enlightened hands. That conformed to the decisions of Anu, Enlil, and even Enki, but was never acquiesced to by Marduk-Ra, And so it was that when the cities of man began to be allocated in the former Eden to the gods, Marduk raised the issue, what about me? Although Sumer was the heartland of the Enlilite territories and its cities were Enlilite cult centers, there was one exception. In the south of Sumer, at the edge of the marshlands, there was Eridu. It was rebuilt after the deluge at the exact same site where Yah and Enki's first settlement on earth had been. It was Anu's insistence when the earth was divided among the rival Anunnaki clans that Enki forever retain Eridu as his own. Circa 3460 BCE, Marduk decided that he could extend his father's privilege to also having his own foothold in the Enlilite heartland. The available texts do not provide the reason why Marduk chose that specific site on the banks of the Euphrates River for his new headquarters, but its location provides a clue. It was situated between the re- rebuilt Nippur, the pre-diluvial mission control center, and the rebuilt Sapar, the pre-diluvial spaceport of the Anunnaki. So what Marduk had in mind could have been a facility that served both functions. A later map of Babylon, drawn on clay tablets, represented it as the navel of the earth, akin to Nippur's original function title. The name Marduk gave the place Bob Ely in Akkadian, meant gateway of the gods, a place from which the gods could ascend and descend, where the appropriate main facility was to be a tower whose head shall reach the heavens, a launch tower. As of the biblical tale, so it is in, told in the parallel and earlier Mesopotamian versions that this attempt to establish a rogue space facility came to naught. Though fragmented, the Mesopotamian texts, first translated by George Smith in 1876, make it clear that Marduk's act infuriated Enlil, who in his anger, a command command poured out for a nighttime attack to destroy the tower. Egyptian records report that a chaotic period lasted 350 years, preceded the start of the pharaonic kingship in Egypt, circa 3110 BCE. It is at this time frame that leads us to date the Tower of Babel incident to circa 3460 BCE. For the end of that chaotic period marked the return of Ra to Egypt, the expulsion of Toth, and the start of the worship of Ra. 
frustrated this time, Marduk never gave up his attempts to dominate the official space facilities that served as the bond of heaven and earth. The link between Nibiru and earth or set up his own facility. Since, in the end, Marduk did attain his aims in Babylon, the interesting question is, why did he fail in 3460 BCE? The equally interesting answer is, it was a matter of timing. A well-known text recorded a conversation between Marduk and his father Enki, in which a disheartened Marduk asked his father what he had failed to learn. What he had failed to do was to take into account the fact that the time then, the celestial time, was the age of the bull, the age of Enlil. Among the thousands of inscribed tablets unearthed in the ancient Near East, quite a number have provided information regarding the month associated with a particular deity in a complex calendar began in Nippur in 3760 BCE. <coughs> the first month, Nanasu, was the Ezen, the festival time for a new Enlil, in a leap year with a 13th lunar month, the honor was split between the two. The list of honorees changed as time went by, as did the composition of the membership of the Supreme Pantheon of Twelve. The month associations also changed locally, not only in various lands, but sometimes to recognize the city god. We know, for example, that the planet we call Venus was initially associated with Ninma and later on Inanna Ishtar. Though such changes make difficult the identifications of who was linked celesti celestially to what, some zodiacal associations can be clearly inferred from text or drawing. Enki, first called Ea, he whose home is water, was clearly associated with the water bearer, Aquarius. And initially, if not permanently, also with the fishes, Pisces. The constellation that was named the twins, Gemini, without a doubt, was so named in honor of the only known divine twins born on earth, Nanar and Sin's children, Utu and Shamash, and Inanna and Ishtar. The feminine constellation of Virgo, the maiden rather than the inaccurate virgin, that, like the planet Venus, was probably named at first in honor of Ninma, was renamed Absin, whose father is Sin, which was, could be correct only for Inanna or Ishtar. The archer or defender, Sagittarius, matched the numerous texts and hymns extolling Ninurta as the divine archer. His father's warrior and defender, Sapar, the city of Utu Shamash, no longer the sign of the spaceport after the deluge, was considered in Sumerian times to be the center of law and justice. And the god was deemed, even by the later Babylonians, as the chief justice of the land. It is certain that the scales of justice Libra represented his constellation. And then there were the nicknames comparing the prowess, strength, or characteristics of a god with an animal held in awe. In Lil, in Lil's, as text after text reiterated, was the bull. It was depicted on cylinder seals, on tablets. Uh, right, the bull. That's, that's, where, that's why... Uh, Enki was supposedly Enki and, 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 and Lil were, you know, being reborn and existing and they were reincarnating in, in different bodies. But Enki was the one that had compassion and he's, you know, related to Pisces and the fish. So he's always been related to the messianic deities, figureheads, Jesus, etc. And of course, uh, in Lil being the negative aspect has always been related to the bull or Baal. And this is why you had, uh, you know, Hebrews in the time of Jesus that were Baal worshippers. Well, they weren't necessarily Baal. The, the, being Baal worshippers meant that they were worshippers of Enlil. They were in, in Enlil cult. And so they didn't, you know, that was what that whole thing was based on. That's the whole uh, foundations of religion are based on all of this, you know, ancient Anunnaki shit, man. It's just, it's a fact. Again, I mean... Um, and he referenced a guy who was writing earlier, 1871, that some of the first translations, I've actually read those translations, the ones that were done in 18, you know, the 1870s. And when you read those, they, they read the same as Zachariah Sitchin's uh, interpretations. So, um, you know, I guess uh, either the, 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 either the, this stuff is, is real and is right. Or, the, you know, the disinfo artists were operating way back in 1875, which I guess is a possibility, but man. Uh, 
that's you know that that that's really the most uh, interesting thing about this is that you know the whole relation with Baal and the Baal and and, and all that stuff and, and and have we seen these the Canaanites worship Baal? That was a pre-Hebrew culture, and uh, yeah, that was it was it was a Enlil cult as they talked about earlier. They had cult centers that were built, and that's what it was. And um, in my opinion, I believe that the current world order still exists of this same type of type of worshipers. I think that Judaism and all the main religions were were spawned off of that. And that's what they've gotten people to do. They've gotten people to worship the Enlil energy, the bull energy, instead of uh, the positive energy of that. And that's that's what they're into. I think they're still drawing upon that bull and uh, Enlil energy to this day. It was depicted on cylinder seals, on tablets, dealing with astronomy and in art. Some of the most beautiful art objects discovered in the royal tombs of Ur were bull heads sculpted in bronze, silver, and gold, adorned with semi-precious stones. Without a doubt, the constellation of the bull, Taurus, honored and symbolized in Lil. Its name, Gudana, meant the bull of heaven. And texts dealing with an actual bull of heaven linked in Lil and his constellation to one of the most unique places on earth. It was a place that was called the landing place. And it is there that one of the most amazing structures on earth, including a stone tower that reaches to the heavens, still stands. Many texts from antiquity, including the Hebrew Bible, describe or refer to the unique forest of tall and great cedar trees in Lebanon. In ancient times, it extended for miles, surrounding the unique place, a vast stone platform built by the gods as their first space-related site on earth before their centers and real spaceports were established. It was, Sumerian texts attested, the only structure that had survived the deluge, and thus could serve right after the deluge as a base of operations for the Anunnaki. From it, they revived the, rav the ravished lands with crops and domesticated animals. The place called the Landing Place in the Epic of Gilgamesh was that, that king's destination in his search for immortality. We learn from the epic tale that it was there in the sacred cedar forest that Enlil kept the Gudana, the bull of heaven, the symbol of Enlil's age of the bull. And what happened then in the sacred forest had a bearing on the course of the affairs of gods and men. To the journey, the journey to the cedar forest and its landing place, we learn from the epic of Gilgamesh, began in Uruk the city that Anu granted as a present to his great-granddaughter Inanna, a name that meant beloved of Anu. Its king early in the third millennium BCE was Gilgamesh. He was no ordinary man, for his mother was the goddess Ninsun, a member of Enlil's family. That made Gilgamesh not a mere demigod, but one who was two-thirds divine. As he got older, see, again, that's a, that's a great term. You know, we think of divine, oh, divine, it was divine powers. Um, you do know we're talking about aliens here, right? I mean, people just, they, they get all this hodgepodge bullshit built up in their brains about, oh, it's, that's divine, oh, it's of God. No, it's of aliens, you stupid motherfucker. Yeah, well, the alien is your God. She agreed with him, but explained to him that the apparent immortality of the gods was in reality longevity due to the long orbital period of their planet. To attain such longevity, he had to join the gods on the Biru, and to do that, he had to go to the place where the rocket ships ascend and descend. Though warned of the journey's hazards, Gilgamesh was determined to go. If I fail, he said, at least I will be remembered as one who had tried. Yeah, here, here. There, that's, I'm with you there, buddy. At his mother's insistence, an artificial double in Kidu was made to be his companion and guardian. Yeah. Uh, straight up made him an R2-D2 or a, uh, a C-3PO to go with him. And that was kind of... Uh, that. I've always thought that that was carried over into Star Wars because uh, you don't see it in the first three movies, but when you watch the other three more recent Star Wars movies, they show that Anakin Skywalker was the one that was responsible for building C-3PO. That was, he started building him as a project when he was a child. 
And then, of course, but you don't see that in the, in the three original movies, but you come to, even though C-3PO played a, a large part in that. And uh, so I think it's very interesting because when uh, Gilgamesh was going out on his journey, you know, they made this, uh, made a robot for him that could translate different languages and basically help him out and be his guardian along the way. That's pretty, uh, I mean, we've seen that in, I think, in science fiction quite a bit. Their adventures told and retold in the epic 12 tablets and its many ancient renderings can be followed in our book, The Stairway to Heaven. There were, in fact, not one but two journeys. One was to the landing place in the Cedar Forest, the other to the spaceport in the Sinai Peninsula, where, according to the Egyptian depictions, rocket ships were emplaced in underground silos. In the first journey, circa 2860 BCE, to the Cedar Forest in Lebanon, the duo were assisted by the god Shamash, the godfather of Gilgamesh, and the going was relatively quick and easy. After they reached the forest, they witnessed during the night the launching of a rocket ship. This is how Gilgamesh described it. The vision that I saw was wholly awesome. The heavens shrieked, the earth boomed. Through daylight, was, though daylight was dawning, darkness came. Lightning flashed, a flame shot up, the, qu- the clouds swelled, it rained death. Then the glow vanished and the fire went out. All that had fallen was turned to ashes. All that for a launching of a rocket ship? That sounds like... See, that's why some of this stuff is, is strange to me, because that, to me, in the description of that on, on the previous page, is it being in a missile silo, didn't sound like a rocket ship to me. This sounds like nuclear missile silos, as we would know them. Because that just doesn't make any sense. You know, the heavens shrieked and the earth boomed, and though it was daylight and dawning, darkness came. Uh, that doesn't sound like a rocket ship blasting off. That sounds like a, a nuclear weapon going off. Lightning flashed, a flame shot up, a cloud swelled, and it rained death. That's not... Come on, Sitchin. That's not just a rocket ship launching. That's an that's a underground nuclear missile silo. No wonder they're so worried about people in the Middle East getting uh, nuclear weapons. Probably afraid they'll unleash some fucking Sumerian shit. Probably what Dinner Jacket's got under his hat in Iran right now. It's probably what he's got. He's probably got some fucking Anunnaki nuke and the fucking New World Order shitting himself scared over this shit. Discovered uh, oh, odd and undeterred the next day, Gilgamesh in Enkidu discovered the secret entrance that had been used by the Anunnaki, but as soon as they entered it, they were attacked by a robot-like guardian who was armed with death beams and a revolving fire. They managed to destroy the monster and relaxed by a brook, thinking that their way was in the clear, but when they ventured deep into the cedar forest, a new challenger appeared, the Bull of Heaven. Unfortunately, the sixth tablet of the epic is too damaged for the lines describing the creature in the battle with it to be completely legible. The legible portions do make it clear that the two comrades ran for their lives, pursued by the bull of heaven all the way back to Uruk. It was there that Enkidu managed to, to slay it. The text becomes legible where the boastful Gilgamesh, who cut off the bull's thigh, called the craftsmen, the armorers, and the artisans of the Uruk to admire the bull's horns. The text, the, uh, text suggests that they were artificially made each is cast from 30 minus of lapis. The coating of each is two fingers thick. So when they slayed this thing, it was actually like a like what they slayed was um, it was some kind of, you know, artificial creation as well. It's a robot or some kind of other uh, not natural uh, creature. Until another tablet with the Ill- illegible lines is discovered, we shall not, not know for sure whether Enlil's celestial symbol is in the cedar forest was a specially selected living bull decorated and embellished with gold and precious stones or a robotic creature, an artificial monster. Oh, I lost my spot. What we do know for certain is that upon its slaying, Ishtar and her abode set up a whale. All the way to Anu in the heavens, meaning she, she let out a scream. The matter was so serious that Anu, Enlil, Enki, and Shamash formed a divine council to judge the comrades. Only 
in Kidu ended up being punished and to consider the slaying's consequences. The ambitious Inanna Ishtar had indeed reason to raise a wail. The invincibility of Enlil's age had been pierced, and the age itself was symbolically shortened by the cutting off of the bull's thigh. We know from Egyptian sources, including pictorial depictions in astronomical papyri, that the slang's symbolism was not lost on Marduk. It was taken to mean that in the heavens, too, the age of Enlil had been cut short. And we're reading from the end of days. Zechariah Sitchin, we're going to pick it up where we left off last time. Until another tablet with the el eligible lines is discovered, we shall not know for sure whether Enlil's celestial symbol in the cedar forest was a specially selected living bull decorated and embellished with gold and precious stones or a robotic creature, an artificial monster. What we do know for certain is that upon its slaying, Ishtar and her abode set up a whale all the way to Anu in the heavens. The matter was so serious that Anu, Enlil, Enki, and Shamash formed a divine council to judge their comrades. Only Enkidu ended up being punished and to consider the slaying's consequences. The ambitious Inanna, it, or Ishtar, had indeed reason to raise a whale. The invincibility of Enlil's age had been pierced, and the age itself was symbolically shorted by the cutting off of the bull's thigh. Marduk's attempt to establish an alternative space facility was not taken lightly by the Enlilites. The evidence suggests that Enlil and Ninurta were preoccupied with establishing their own alternative space facility. And other on the other side of the earth, in the Americas, near the post-alluvial sources of gold. This absence, together with the Bull of Heaven incident, ushered in a period of instability and confusion in their Mesopotamian heartland, subjecting it to incursions from neighboring lands. People called Gutians and the Elamites came from the east. Semitic-speaking people came from the west. But while the Easterners worshipped the same Enlilite gods as the Sumerians, the Amuru, the Westerners, were different. Along the shores of the Upper Sea, the Mediterranean, and the lands of the Canaanites, the people were beholden to the Inkiite gods of Egypt. Therein lay the seeds, perhaps to this day, of holy wars undertaken in the name of God, except that different peoples had different national gods. Right, because these motherfuckers were going everywhere, setting themselves up as gods, setting up old franchises everywhere they went. And then warring over which franchise you know, was the best. Gee, that sounds like our corporate model that we use to this day, doesn't it? No, that's just a coincidence, I'm sure. It was Inanna who came up with the brilliant idea. It can be described as, if you can't find them, invite them. One day, as she was roaming the skies in her sky chamber, it happened circa 2360 BCE, she landed in a garden next to a sleeping man who caught her fancy. And uh, my friend Delphi, when she was in Saudi Arabia, they, they she was someplace there over there, and they, they told her that this place she was at was where Anana landed. And that's literally how they say it, you know. And, you know, religious people, it's like, oh, she landed there. Now that's where she, you know, was born or where she came. She landed, literally like, you know, landing in a ship. And that's just how people say it there. Isn't that crazy? And they literally just say these people landed there. She landed in a garden next to a sleeping man who caught her fancy. She liked the sex. She liked the man, and he was a Westerner speaking a Semitic language. As wrote later in his memoirs, he knew not who his father was, but knew that his mother was an Intu, a god's priestess who put him in a reed basket that was carried by the river's flowing waters to a garden tended by Aki the irrigator, who raised him as a son. The possibility that the strong and handsome man could have been a god's cast-off son was enough for Inanna to recommend to the other gods that the next king of the land should be this Amaru. When they agreed, she granted him the epitaph name Sharu Kin, the old cherished title of Sumerian kings. Not stemming from the previous recognized royal Sumerian lineages, he could not ascend the throne in any one of the olden capitals. 
and a brand new city was established to serve as his capital. It was called the Agade, the Union City. Our textbooks call this King Sargon of Akkad and his Semitic language Akkadian. His kingdom, which added northern and northwestern provinces to ancient Sumer, was called Sumer and Akkad. Sargon lost little time in carrying out the mission for which he was selected to bring the rebel lands under control. Hems to Inanna, henceforth known by the Akkadian name Ishtar, <coughs> had her tell Sargon that he would be remembered by the destruction of the rebel land massacring its people, making its rivers run with blood. Sargon's military expeditions were recorded and glorified in his own royal annals. His achievements were summarized in the Sargon Chronicles thus. Sharu Kin, king of Agade, rose to power in the era of Ishtar. He left neither rival nor opponent. He spread his terror-inspiring awe in all of the lands. He crossed the sea in the east. He conquered the country of the West in its full extent. The boast implies that the sacred space-related site, the landing place deep in the country of the West, was captured and held on behalf of Inanna or Ishtar, but not without opposition. Even texts written in glorification of Sargon state that in his old age, all the provinces revolted against him. Counter- Annals recording the events as viewed from Marduk's side reveal that Marduk led a punishing counteroffensive. On account of the sacrilege Sargon committed, the great god Marduk became enraged. From east to west, he alienated the people from Sargon and punished them with an affliction of being without rest. Sargon's territorial reach, it needs to be noted, included only one of the four post alluvial space related sites. Only the landing place in the Cedar Forest. Sargon was briefly succeeded on the throne of Sumer and Akkad by two sons, but his true successor in spirit and deed was a grandson named Naram Sin. The name meant Sin's favorite. The annals and inscriptions concerning his reign and military campaigns show that he was in fact Ishtar's favorite. Texts and depictions record that Ishtar encouraged the king to seek grandeur and greatness by ceaseless conquest and destruction of her enemies actively assisting them on the battlefields. Depictions of her, which used to show her as an enticing goddess of love, now showed her as a goddess of war bristling with weapons. It was, not, it was warfare not without a plan, a plan to counter Marduk's ambitions by capturing all the space-related sites on behalf of Ishtar. The lists of cities captured or subdued by Naram Sin indicate that he not only reached the Mediterranean Sea, assuring control of the landing place, but also turned southward to invade Egypt. Such an incursion into Inkyite domains was unprecedented, and it could take place. A careful reading of the records reveals because Inanna and Isht Ishtar had formed an unholy alliance with Nurgle. And when I was in the uh, world's largest Masonic cathedral in Gu Guthrie, Oklahoma, they had a, uh, an Assyrian room there. I've got pictures of it. And uh, it was closed to the public at that time because they were doing renovations on it. And uh, the guy who was leading the tour was a Mason. And we told him we came all the way from Dallas. And he said, yeah, you know what? I'll take y'all in there and let y'all see it. And he took us in there to see it. And I've got pictures of it. There's, there's, there was depictions of Nurgle on the wall. Um. So if, uh, if Inanna creating a, a, an alliance with Nurgle is an unholy alliance, um, then why are the Freemasons, you know, depicting him in, in such a grandiose, grandiose way uh, as if they're worshiping him inside of their Masonic lodges? Well, I mean, my goodness. So it's an unholy union. So the, the Masons have to have Nurgle in there? Hmm. Marduk's brother, who espoused and not his sister, uh, was Nurgle, and the, the thrust into Egypt also required entering and crossing the neutral sacred region in the Sinai Peninsula, where the spaceport was located, another breach of the Olden Peace Treaty. Boastful Naram Sin gave himself the title the King of the Four Regions. 
uh, it, um, I don't know if any of you, I don't have a PDF copy of this. Uh, I just got one off of Amazon. I just went ahead and paid for it and got it so I could read it. But uh, if you have a copy of this book, um, look at, I'm on the page where it has a drawing uh, with a number on it, figure 16 underneath it. And there's two drawings of, of some Sumerians up there. The one on the right looks very reptilian. And I guess this is supposed to be the one that's uh, portraying Nurgle. That's pretty interesting. We can hear the protests of Enki. We can read texts that record Marduk's warnings. It was all more than even the Enlilite leadership could condone. A long text known as the Curse of the Agade, which tells the story of the Akkadian dynasty, clearly states that its end came about after the frowning of the forehead of Enlil. And so the word of Ikur, the decision of Enlil from his temple in Nippur, was to put it to an end. The word of Ikur was upon Agate, to be destroyed and wiped off the face of the earth. Naram Sin's end came circa 2260 BCE. Texts from that time report that troops from the territory in the east called Gutium, loyal to Ninurta, were the instrument of divine wrath. Agade was never rebuilt, never resettled. That royal city, indeed, has never been found. And, see, it's those kind of things that make me wonder if that's what, you know, places like the Rock Wall and other of these things that have been covered up in the United States could be. These ancient sites that were wiped off and, you know, the rulers don't want there to be any record of it. The saga of Gilgamesh at the start of the 3rd millennium BCE and the, and the military forays of the Akkadian kings near the end of that millennium provide a clear background for that millennium's events. The targets were the space-related sites by Gilgamesh to attain the god's longevity and the kings beholden to Ishtar to attain supremacy. Without doubt, it was Marduk's Tower of Babel attempt that placed the control of the space-related sites at the center of the affairs of gods and men. As we shall see, that centrality dominated much, if not most, of what took place later. The Akkadian phase of the war and peace on Earth was not without celestial or messianic aspects. In his chronicles, Sargon's titles followed the customary honorific overseer of Ishtar, king of Kish, great N.C. of Enlil. But he also called himself anointed priest of Anu. It was the first time that being divinely anointed, which is what Messiah literally means, appears in ancient inscriptions. Now, that's important. Marduk, in his pronouncements, warned of coming up evils and cosmic phenomena. Now, that's interesting. Um, cosmic phenomena and, and upheavals being uh, related together, because that's what's said about, um, about the supposed planet uh, Vulcan that people have kind of, you know, turned into this meme of Nibiru when, you know, there's actually documented stuff of this being a, uh, uh, you know, uh, an actual thing. I'm sorry, I lost track here. The day shall be turned into darkness. The flow of the river water shall be disarrayed. The land shall be laid to waste. The people will be made to perish. Looking back, recalling similar biblical prophecies, it is clear that on the eve of the 21st century BCE, gods and men expected a coming apocalyptic time. So that's an interesting thing. So during that, so during the time period that was happening, uh, when we were living in now, that was happening during the, the BCE times, they were expecting an apocalypse, just as we are now. So that's the end of chapter two. I'd like to get into some of chapter three for you here tonight. Egyptian prophecies and human destinies. The end of days by Zachariah Sitchin. In the annals of man on earth, the 21st century BCE saw in the ancient Near East one of the civilization's most glorious chapters. Known as the Ur-3 period, it was at the same time the most difficult and crushing one for it witnessed the end of Sumer in a deathly nuclear cloud. And after that, nothing was the same. 
Those monumentous events, as we shall see, were also the root of the Messianic manifestations that centered on Jerusalem when BCE turned to AD some 21 centuries later. The historic events of that memorable century, as all the events of history, had their roots in what had taken place before. Of that, the year 2160 BCE is a date worth remembering. The annals of Samir and Akkad from that period record a major policy shift by the Enlilite gods. In Egypt, the date marked the beginning of changes of political religious significance, and what occurred in both zones coincided with a new phase in Marduk's campaign to attain supremacy. Indeed, it was Marduk's chess-like strategy maneuvers and geographic movements from one place to another that controlled the agenda of the era's divine chess game. His moves and movements began with a departure from Egypt to become in Egyptianized Ammon, also written Ammon or Amen. Or Amen. The date of 2160 BCE is considered by Egyptologists to mark the beginning of what is designated the first intermediate period, a chaotic interval between the end of the Old Kingdom and the dynastic start of the Middle Kingdom. During the thousand years of the Old Kingdom, when the religious political capital was Memphis in Middle Egypt, the Egyptians worshipped the Ptah pantheon, erecting monumental temples to him, to his son Ra, and to their divine successors. The famed inscriptions of the Memphite pharaohs glorified the gods and promised an afterlife for the kings. Reigning as the gods' surrogates, those pharaohs wore the double crown of Upper, the upper, the southern and the lower northern Egypt, signifying not just the administrative, but also the religious unification of the two lands. Unification attained when Horus defeated Seth in their struggles for the Ptah Ra legacy. And then in 2160 BCE, that unity and religious certainty came crashing down. The turmoil saw a breakup of the Union, abandonment of the capital, attacks from the south by the Theban princes to gain control, foreign incursions, desecration of temples, and a collapse of raw of law and order, droughts, famines, and food riots. Those conditions are recalled in a papyrus known as the Emanations of Ifu Wer, a long hieroglyphic text that contains several sections in which it gives an account of calamities and tribulations. It blames an unholy enemy for religious wrongdoing and social evils and calls on the people to repent and resume the religious rites. A prophetic section describing the coming of a redeemer and another that extols the ideal times that will follow conclude the papyrus. At its start, the text describes the breakdown of law and order and of a functioning society, a situation in which the doorkeepers go and plunder, the washman refuses to carry his load, robbery is everywhere, a man regards his son as an enemy. Though the Nile is in flooding, is in flooding, and irrigates the land. No one plows, grain is perished, the storehouses are bare, dust is through the land, the desert spreads, women are dried up, no one can conceive, the dead are just thrown into the river, the river is blood, the roads are unsafe, trade has ceased, the provinces of Upper Egypt are no longer taxed, there is civil war, barbarians from elsewhere have come to Egypt, all is in ruin. Some Egyptologists believe that at the core of those events lay a simple rivalry for wealth and power. An attempt, successful in the end, by Theban princes from the south to control and rule the whole country. Lately, studies have associated the collapse of the Old Kingdom with a climate change that undermined a society founded on agriculture, caused food shortages and food riots, social upheaval, and collapse of authority. But little attention has been paid to a major and perhaps the most important change. <coughs> In the texts, in the hymns, in the honorific names of temples, it was no longer Ra, but from then on, Ra Amun, Amun Ra, who was henceforth worshipped. Ra became Amun, Ra the Unseen, for he was gone from Egypt. Uh, right, kind of like in the movie Stargate. It was indeed a religious change. That caused the political and societal breakdown. The unidentified Upu Wer wrote, We believe that the change was Ra becoming Amun. The upheaval began with a collapse of religious observances, 
and manifested itself in the defiling and abandonment of temples where the place of secrets had been laid bare. The writings of the August enclosure had been scattered. Common men tear them up in the streets. Magic is exposed. It is in the sight of him who knows it not. So, so their shit got, their, their secrets and their magic got exposed to the common man. Oh, heaven forbid that. The sacred symbol of the gods worn on the king's crown, the Uraeus, the divine serpent. Uh, right, the, the serpent eating its tail. Is rebelled against. Religious dates are disturbed. Priests are carried off wrongfully. After calling on the people to repent, to offer incense in the temples, to keep the offerings to the gods, the papyrus called on the repenters to be baptized, to remember to immerse. Then the words of the papyrus turn prophetic in a passage that even Egyptologists call truly messianic. The admonitions speak of a time that shall come when an unnamed savior, a god king, shall appear. Starting with a small following of him, men shall say, he brings coolness upon the heart. He's a shepherd of all men. Though his herds may be small, he will spend the days caring for them. Then he would smite down evil. He would stretch forth his arms against it. People will be asking, where is he today? Is he then sleeping? Why is his power not seen? Ippur wrote, and he answered, Behold, the glory thereof cannot be seen. But authority, perception, and justice are with him. So even though, you know, yeah, that's saying, you know, you might look at somebody, you might look at th this person and think they're just nobody, but uh, that person could be the savior. Those ideal times, Upper were stated in his prophecy, will be preceded by their own messianic birth pangs. Confusion will be set throughout the land, and tumultuous noise, one will kill the other, and the many will kill the few. People will ask, does the shepherd desire death? No, he answered, it is the land that commands death. But after years of strife, righteousness and proper worship will prevail. This, the papyrus concluded, was what Upper Wur said when he responded to the majesty of the All-Lord. If not just the description of events in the Messianic prophecies, but also the choice of wording in that ancient Egyptian papyrus seem astounding, there is more to come. Scholars are aware of the existence of another prophetic Messianic text that reached us from ancient Egypt, but believe that it was really composed after the events that only pretends to be prophetic, by dating itself to an earlier time. To be specific, while the text purports to relate prophecies made at the time of Sneferu, a 4th dynasty pharaoh circa 2600 BCE, Egyptologists believe that it was actually written in the time of Amentet I of the 12th dynasty circa 2000 BCE. After the events that it pretends to prophecy, even so, the prophecies can serve to confirm those prior occurrences and many details in the very wording of the predictions can be best described as chilling. The prophecies are purported to be told to King Sneferu by a great seer priest named Neferahu, a man of rank, a scribe, competent with his fingers. Summoned to the king to foretell the future, Neferahu stretched forth his hand for the box of writing equipment. He drew forth a scroll of papyrus and then began to write what he was envisioning in a Nostradamus-like manner. Behold, there is something about which men speak. It is terrifying. What will be done was never done before. The earth is completely perished. The land is damaged. No remainder exists. There is no sunshine that people could see. No one can live without the covering clouds. No one can live without the covering clouds. The earth is completely perished. The land is damaged. No one can live without the covering clouds. What, like chemtrails? Something happens in, 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 uh, either with the sun or maybe an event we, we do with nuclear weapons or something like that. And we damage our atmosphere and we have to, uh, you know, spray these chemtrails in the air. That's pretty unbelievable. That is pretty fucking chilling, if you ask me. I mean, he's right there. Wow. 
No one can live without the covering clouds. The south wind opposes the north wind. The rivers of Egypt are empty. Ra must begin the foundations of the earth again. Before Ra can restore the foundations of the earth, there will be invasions, wars, bloodshed. Then a new era of peace, tranquility, and justice will follow. It will be brought by what we have come to call a savior, a messiah. Then it is that a sovereign will come, a many, the unknown, the triumphant he will be called. The son man, the son man will be his name forever and ever. Wrongdoing will be driven out. Justice in its place will come. The people of his time rejoice. It is astounding to find such messianic prophecies of apocalyptic times and the end of wrongdoing that will be followed by the coming, the return of peace and injustice. In papyrus texts written some 4,200 years ago, it is chilling to find them in terminology that is familiar from the New Testament about an unknown, the triumphant, the sun man. It is, as we shall see, a link in millennia-spanning interconnected events. In Sumer, a period of chaos, occupation by foreign troops, defiling of temples, and confusion as to where the capital should be and who should be king followed the end of the Sargonic era of Ishtar in 2260 BCE. For a while, the only safe haven in the land was Ninurta's cult center, Lagash, from which the Gudian foreign troops were kept out. Mindful of Marduk's unrelenting ambitions, Ninurta decided to reassert his right to the rank of 50 by instructing the then king of Lagash, Gudia, to erect for him in the city's Gersu, the sacred precinct, a new and different temple. Ninurta, here called Ningersu, lord of the Gersu, already had a temple there, and as well a special enclosure for his divine blackbird or flying machine. Yeah, the divine blackbird, the fucking... Klingon bird of prey. I'm telling you, man, that's it's all going to come out in the end. We're gonna, all going to find out we were fucking seeded from Klingons. God damn it. I'm going to be so fucking pissed when that comes out. Of all the goddamn dirty motherfuckers in the universe we could have been seeded from, we had to be seeded by fucking Klingons. Great, so we're all fucking part Klingon. I'm, that's just fucking wonderful. You know, no, nothing I've ever found in my research has pissed me off. And that, fuck Klingons, man. Klingons, no, it really explains everything for me now. Now I know why we're so fucked up as a people on this planet. We're fucking Klingons. Klingons are fucking dumb. God, man. That really explains a lot. We were exceeded from Klingons here on Earth. That's why we're so retarded. That's why we fuck everything up. Cloaked planes can't save us from fucking up our planet. Uh, where did I leave off? Yet the building of the new temple required special permission from Enlil, which was in time granted. We learn from the inscriptions that the new temple had to have special features, linking it to the heavens, enabling certain celestial observations. To that end, Ninurta invited to Samir the god Ningazita, Toth in Egypt. the divine architect and keeper of the secrets of the Giza pyramids, the fact that Ningazita, or Toth, was the brother whom Marduk forced into exile circa 3100 BCE was certainly not lost on all concerned. The amazing circumstances surrounding the announcement, planning, construction, and dedication of E. Ninu, the House of Temple of Fifty, are told in great detail in Gudea's inscriptions. They were also unearthed in the ruins of Lagash, a site now called Tello, and were quoted at length in the Earth Chronicles book. What emerges from that detailed record inscribed on two clay cylinders in clear Sumerian cuneiform script is the fact that from announcement to dedication, every step and every detail of the new temple was dictated by celestial aspects. Those special celestial aspects had to do with the very timing of the temple's building. It was the time, as the inscription's opening lines declare, when, quote, in the heavens, destinies on earth were determined. At the time when in heaven destinies on earth were determined, Lagash shall, shall lift its head heavenwards in accordance with the great tablet of destinies. Enlil, in favor of Ninurta, declared. 
That special time when the destinies on earth are determined in the heavens was what we have called celestial time, the zodiacal clock. That such determining was linked to equinox, day becomes evident from the rest of Gudea's tale, as well as from Toth's Egypt name Tehuti, the balancer of day and night, who draws the cord for orienting a new temple. Such celestial considerations continue to dominate the Aninu project from start to finish. The end of days. Gudea's tale begins with a vision dream that reads like an episode from the Twilight Zone TV series. For while the several gods featured in it were gone when he awoke, the various objects they showed him in the dream remained physically lying by his side. In that dream vision, the first of several, the god Ninurta appeared at sunrise and the sun was aligned with the planet Jupiter. The god spoke and informed Gudea that he was chosen to build a new temple. Next, the goddess Nisva appeared, and she was wearing the image of a temple structure on her head. The goddess was holding a tablet on which the starry heavens were depicted, and with a stylus, she kept pointing to the favorable celestial constellation. A third god, Ningazita, i.e. Toth, held a tablet of lapis lazuli on which a structural plan was drawn. He also held a clay brick, a mold for brick-making, and a builder's carrying basket. When Gudea awoke, the three gods were gone, but the architectural tablet was in his lap, and the brick and mold were at his feet. Gudea needed the help of an oracle goddess and two more vision dreams to understand the meaning of it all. In the third vision dream, he was shown a holographic-like animated demonstration of the temple's building, starting with the initial alignment with the indicated celestial point, the laying of foundations, the molding of bricks, the construction all the way up step by step. Both the start of construction and the final dedication ceremony were to be held on signals from the gods on specific days. Both fell on New Year's Day, which meant the day of spring equinox. The temple raised its head in the customary seven stages, but unusually for that flat-top Sumerian ziggurats, its head had to be pointed shaped like a horn. Gudea had to emplace upon the temple's top a capstone. Its shape is not described, but in all probability, and judging by the image on Nisaba's head, it was in the shape of a pyramidion, in the manner of the capstones on the Egyptian pyramids. And the pyramidion is an interesting thing in Egyptology because um, it was only really dis- it was only discovered. Uh, not too long, not too far in the distant past, and uh, they found b- both uh, pi and the golden ratio within the pyramidion, and and everybody thinks a pyramidion is, is just a capstone that wasn't placed there, but uh, actually, what it is is it's it's actually a uh, a model, a replica model, a small scale version of uh, of a pyramid in the style of the Great Pyramid, and uh, in the because the measurements. Of pi and golden ratio are in the, are are accurate and in the small version. You can also apply that to any size you want using the same mathematics and using that small little model, the pyramidian, build um, as many pyramids as you wanted based on the mathematics in in the pyramidian. So that's what it is. It's kind of like a master key. Moreover, rather than leave the brickwork exposed as was customary. Gudea was required to encase the structure with a casing of reddish stones, increasing its similarity to an Egyptian pyramid. The outside view of the temple was like that of a mountain set in place. The raising a structure with the appearance that raising a structure with the appearance of an Egyptian pyramid had a purpose becomes clear from Ninurta's own words. The new temple, he told Gudea, will be seen from afar. Its awe-inspiring glance will reach the heavens. The adoration of my temple shall extend to all the lands. Its heavenly name will be proclaimed in countries from the end of the earth. In Megan and Malahua, it will cause people to say, Ningershu, the lord of the Gersu, the great hero from the lands of Enlil, 
It's a God who has no equal. He is the Lord of all of the earth. Megan and Lahula were the Sumerian names for Egypt and Nubia, the two lands of the gods of Egypt. The purpose of the Yaninu was to establish, even there in Marduk's lands, Ninurta's unequal lordship, a god who has no equal, the lord of all the earth. Proclaiming Ninurta rather than Marduk's supremacy required special features in the Yaninu. The ziggurat's entrance had to face the sun precisely in the east rather than the customary northeast. In the temple's topmost level, Gudea had to erect a shugalam, where the shining is announced, the place of the aperture, the place of determining from which Ninurta and Nigershu could see the repetition over the lands. It was a circular chamber with 12 positions, each marked with a zodiacal symbol, with an aperture for observing the skies and ancient planetarium aligned to the zodiacal constellations. In the temple's forecourt, linked to an avenue that faced sunrise, Gudea had to erect two stone circles, one with six and the other with seven stone pillars for observing the skies. Since only one avenue is mentioned, one assumes that the circles were one within the other. As one studies each phrase, terminology, and structural detail, it becomes evident that what was built in Lagash with the help of Ningazita Toth was a complex yet practical stone observatory one part of which, devoted entirely to the Zodiacs, reminds one of the similar one found in Dendera, Egypt. And the other gear to observing celestial, yeah, in Dendera, in Egypt, the, the Temple of Hathor, inside of it, that's actually where the oldest known Zodiacal wheel uh, is depicted. It's inside of the Temple of Hathor, Dendera, and uh, it's, it, it's thousands of years before well, we, we're, we're said to have had um, astrology. Uh, I, I, that's my, uh, man, if I go any place on earth, that's where I'd want to go. I want to write a book and make a movie about the Temple of Hathor Dendera. It's totally fascinating. There aren't any books written about it. There aren't any documentaries about it. There's a total blackout. They won't even talk about it on ancient aliens, even though they show it in the background of the intro. And the reason they won't talk about it is because if you, if you really study it and look at the pictures, they, the, 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 the whole thing is dedicated to genetic manipulation. I mean, they admit everything in the Temple of Hathor. Did they show these machines they had for making physical flame bodies that the spirits would manifest themselves in? The thing is built to the scale of giants. I mean, there's a picture. You can, if you go to Google Images and type in uh, Temple of Hathor and scroll through the pictures, you'll find eventually find a picture. There's a, it's a little uh, Egyptian man, and he's seated on, on this pillar. And sitting next to the pillar, this little Egyptian man, I mean, he looks tiny. And then you realize, oh, wait, that's inside the Temple of Hathor Dendera. And then you notice that there's stuff on, on the ceilings, painted, fully detailed stuff. This thing was built to the scale of giants. And uh, it's largely, um, hugely uncovered in the realm of Egyptology, in the realm of documentaries and books. And everything. I've searched and searched and searched, Amazon, everywhere. No books dedicated to even getting into any of the stuff in the Temple of Hathor. And uh, again... Uh, you wouldn't have to have any of these ancient alien shows ever again if you just really got into what was in that place. And the other gear to observing celestial risings and setting a virtual stone hinge on the banks of the Euphrates River. Like Stonehenge in the British Isles, the one built in Lagash provided stone markers for solar observatories and solstices and equinoxes, but the prime outside feature was the creation of a slight line from a center stone continued between two stone pillars and then on down an avenue to another stone. Such a sight line, precisely oriented when planned, enabled determining at the moment of helical rising in which zodiacal constellation the sun was appearing. <coughs> and that, determining the zodiacal age through precise observation, was the prime objective of the whole complex facility. In Stonehenge, the slight line ran and still runs from the stone column called the Altar Stone in the center through two stone columns identified as Sarsen Stones, numbers 1 and 30, then down the avenue to the so-called Heel Stone. It is generally agreed that the Stonehenge with a double blue stone circle and the Heel Stone of what is designated Stonehenge 2 
dates to between 2200 and 2100 BCE. That was also the time, perhaps more accurately, in 2160 BCE when the Stonehenge on the Euphrates was built. And that was no chance coincidence. Like those two zodiacal observatories, other stone observatories proliferated at the same time in other places on Earth. At various sites in Europe and South America, on the Golan Heights of northeast of Israel, even in faraway China, where archaeologists discovered in the Shanxi province a stone circle with 13 pillars aligned to the zodiac dating to 2100 BCE. They were all deliberate countermoves by Ninurta and Ningazita to Marduk's divine chess game to show mankind that the zodiacal age was still the age of the bull. Various texts from that time, including an autobiographical text by Marduk and a longer text known as the Era Epos, shed light on Marduk's wanderings away from Egypt, making him there, hidden, there the hidden one. They also reveal that his demands and actions assumed an urgency and ferocity because of a conviction that his time for supremacy had come. The heavens bespeak my glory as Lord, was his claim. Why? Because he announced the age of the bull, the age of Enlil was over. The age of the ram, Marduk's zodiacal age, had arrived. It was just as Ninurta, Ninurta had told Gudea, the time when in the heavens, destinies on earth were determined. The zodiacal ages, it will be recalled, were caused by the phenomenon of procession the retardation in Earth's orbit around the sun. The retardation accumulates to one degree out of 360 in 72 years. An arbitrary division of the grand circle into 12 segments of 30 degrees each means that mathematically the zodiacal calendar shifts from one age to another every 2,160 years. Since the deluge occurred, according to Sumerian texts, in the age of the lion, our zodiacal clock can start circa 10860 BCE. An astounding timetable emerges if, in this mathematically determined 2160 year zodiacal calendar, the starting point of 10800 BC rather than 10860 BC is chosen. 10800 to 8640 BCE, the age of the lion, Leo. 8640 to 6. 480 BCE, the age of the crab, Cancer. 6480 to 4320 BCE, the age of the twins, Gemini. 4320 to 2160, the age of the bull, Taurus. And 2160 to 0 BCE, the age of the ram, Aries. Setting aside the neat end result that synchronizes with the Christian era, one must wonder whether it was mere coincidence that the Ishtar Ninurta era petered out in or about 2160 BCE just when, according to the above zodiacal calendar, the age of the bull in Lil's age was also ending. Probably not. Certainly, Marduk did not think so. The available evidence suggests that he was sure that, according to celestial time, his time for supremacy, his age, had arrived. Modern studies of Mesopotamian astronomy indeed confirm that the zodiacal circle was divided into 12 houses of 30 degrees each, a mathematical rather than an observational division. The various texts we have mentioned indicate that as he moved about, Marduk made another foray into the Enlilite heartland, arriving back in Babylon with a retinue of followers. Rather than resort to armed conflict, uh, sorry about that, I lost. Rather than resort to armed conflict, the Enlilites enlisted Marduk's brother Nurgle whose spouse was a granddaughter of Enlil, to come to Babylon from southern Africa and persuade his brother to leave. In his memoirs, known as the Era Epos, Nurgle reported that Marduk's chief argument was, at the time, the age of the ram had arrived. But Nurgle counter-argued that it is not really so. The heliacal rising, he told Marduk, still occurs in the constellation of the bull. Enraged, Marduk questioned the accuracy of the observations, what happened to the precise and reliable instruments from before the deluge that were installed in your lower world domain? He demanded to know from Nurgle. Nurgle explained that they were destroyed by the deluge. Come and see for yourself which constellation is seen at sunrise on the appointed day, he urged Marduk. Whether Marduk went to Lagash to make the observation, we do not know, but he did realize the cause of the discrepancy. 
While mathematically the ages changed every 2,160 years, in reality, observationally, they did not. The zodiacal constellations in which stars were grouped arbitrarily were not of equal size. Some occupied a larger arc of the heavens, some smaller, and as it happened, the constellation of the Ram was one of the smaller ones, squeezed between the larger Taurus and Pisces. Celestially, the constellation Taurus, occupying more than 30 degrees of the heavenly arc, lingers on for at least another two centuries beyond its mathematical length. In the 21st century BCE, celestial time and messianic time failed to coincide. We go away peacefully and come back when the heavens will declare your age, Nurgle told Marduk. Yielding to his fate, Marduk did leave, but did not go too far away. And with him as emissary, spokesman, and herald, his son, whose mother was an earthling woman. And uh, that's the end of chapter 3. We're going to get into chapter 4 now, the end of days from Zachariah Sitchin of gods and demigods. The decision of Marduk to stay in or near the contested lands and to involve his son in the struggle for mankind's allegiance persuaded the Enlilites to return Samir's central capital to Ur, the cult center of Nanar. It was the third time that Ur was chosen to serve in that capacity, hence the designation Ur-3 for that period. The move linked the affairs of the contending gods to the biblical tale and the role of Abraham, and the intertwined relationship changed religion to this day. Among the many reasons for the choice of Nanar as the Enlilite champion was the realization that contending with Marduk had expanded beyond the affairs of gods alone and had become a contest for the minds and hearts of the people, of the very earthlings whom the gods had created who now made up the armies that went to war on behalf of their creators. Unlike other Enlilites, Nanar, slash, or also known as Sin, was not a combatant in the wars of the gods. His selection was meant to signal to people everywhere, even in the rebel lands, that under his leadership, an era of peace and prosperity would begin. He and his spouse, Ningle, were greatly beloved by the people of Sumer, and Ur itself spelled prosperity and well-being in its very name, which meant urban, domesticated place, and came to mean not just city, but the city, the urban jewel of the ancient lands. Nanar's temple there, a skyscraping ziggurat, rose in stages within a walled sacred precinct where a variety of structures served as the gods' abode and the residences and functional buildings of a legion of priests, officials, and servants who attended to the divine couple's needs and arranged the religious observances by king and people. Beyond those walls, there extended a magnificent city with two harbors and canals, linking it to the Euphrates River. A great city with a king's palace, administrative buildings, including for scribes and record-keeping, as well as for tax collecting. Oh, yeah, the tax man. <laughs> yeah, another, yeah, so, well, see, there you go. Another thing we can thank these Anunnaki motherfuckers for, right? Yeah. They're the ones that brought about the income tax, first off. <laughs> so not only did they seed us with uh, with life and culture and all this, they, 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 they also brought us the wonderful uh, tax collector. Thank you so much, Anunnaki. We really appreciate that. Multi-level private dwellings, workshops, schools, merchants, warehouses, and stalls, all in a wide street where, at many intersections, Prayer shrines open to all travelers were built. The majestic ziggurat with its monumental stairways, though long in ruins, still dominates the landscape even more, even after more than 4,000 years. But there was another compelling reason. Unlike contending Ninurta and Marduk, who were both immigrants to Earth from Nibiru, Nanar was born on Earth. He was not only in Lil's firstborn on Earth, he was the first of the first generation of gods to be born on Earth. His children, the twins Utu, Shamash, and Inanna Ishtar, and their sister Erish Gigal, who belonged to the gods' third generation, were all born on Earth. They were gods, but they were also Earth's natives. 
all that was with a doubt, without doubt taken into consideration into the coming struggle for the loyalties of the people. The choice of a new king to restart a fresh kingship in from Samir was also carefully made. Gone was the free hand given to or assumed by Inanna Ishtar, who chose Sargon, the Akkadian, to start a new dynasty because she liked his lovemaking. Man, this shit just sounds like fucking Dune, doesn't it? It's like Dune and Klingons from Star Trek all wrapped into one. Sargon, the Akkadian. I mean, come on. It sounds pretty close to, you know, uh, Paul Atreides of the clan Atreides, you know. The sleeper has awakened. She wanted to start a new dynasty all because she liked this fool's lovemaking. Unbelievable. So you see, it's not just Inky that was going around pouring beer pitchers of his sperm into any womb that was around at the moment. No, even, even, even the chicks couldn't, couldn't keep their legs closed. She started a new dynasty because she liked the way this fool fucked her. No, I think I like the way you fuck. Let's start a new civilization, shall we? Jesus Christ, can we go out on a second date, please? From first base to fucking Grand Slam the first night, man. I mean, I know my dick's good, but goddamn. You're already starting to want to, want to start a new dynasty? You like the dick that much? Slow down, girl. Shit, let's go out to a fucking Olive Garden or something first before you start talking about, let's, let's start a dynasty. Shit, that's strong words. The new king named ur -Nanu, Namu was carefully selected by Enlil and approved by Anu, and he was no mere earthling. He was a son, the beloved son of the goddess Ninsun. She had been the reader, she had been, the reader will call, the mother of Gilgamesh. Since this divine genealogy was restarted, in, restated in numerous inscriptions during Ur-Namu's reign, in the presence of Nanar and other gods, one must assume that the claim was factual. This made Ur-Namu not only a demigod, but as was the case of Gilgamesh, two-thirds divine. Indeed, the claim that the king's mother was the goddess Ninzan placed Ur-Namu in the very same status as that of Gilgamesh, whose exploits were well-remembered and whose name remained revered. The choice was thus a signal to friends and foes alike that the glorious days under the unchallenged authority of Enlil and his clan are back. All that was important, perhaps even crucial, because Marduk had his own attributes of appeal to the masses of mankind. That special appeal to the earthlings was the fact that Marduk's deputy and chief campaigner was his son, Nabu, who not only was born on earth, but was born to a mother who herself was an earthling. For long ago, indeed, in the days before the deluge, Marduk broke all traditions in taboos and took an earthling woman to be his official wife. Because earthling women got the good poontang, man. Everybody knows that. Everybody in the whole galaxy knows that. Well, you know, in some cases, not all cases, sometimes it's, uh, it's not good at all. But, you know, it's still better than Anunnaki vag. Oh, that stuff. Whew. Man. You ever ate at Arby's before? Next time you go to Arby's, take one of their, their, their sandwiches and hold it sideways. Yeah, that's what Anunnaki vag looks like. Not that I've seen it or anything, but, you know, that's what, I'm, that's what I'm told. That young Anunnaki took earthling females as wives should not come as a shocking surprise, for it's recorded even in the Bible for all to see, right? Yeah. Made it with, a, with the daughters of man. What is little known, even to scholars, because the information is found in ignored texts and has to be verified from complex God lists, is the fact that it was Marduk who set the example that the sons of God followed. And it came to pass when the earthlings began to increase in number upon the earth and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of the Elohim saw the daughters of the Adam, that they were compatible. And they took unto themselves these wives of whichever they chose. Genesis 6-1-2. 
The biblical explanation of the reasons for the great flood in the first eight enigmatic verses of chapter 6 of Genesis clearly points to the intermarriage and its resulting offspring as the cause of the divine wrath. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and thereafter too, when the sons of the Elohim came unto the daughters of the Adam and had children by them. My readers may recall that it was my question as a schoolboy of why Nephilim, which literally means those who have come down, who descended from heaven to earth, was usually translated as giants. It was much later that I realized and suggested that the Hebrew word for giants, Anakim, was actually a rendering of the Sumerian Anunnaki. The Bible clearly cites such intermarriage, the taking as wives between young sons of the gods, sons of the Elohim, the Nephilim, and female earthlings, daughters of the Adam, as God's reason for seeking mankind's end by the deluge. My spirit shall no longer dwell in man, for in his flesh they erred. And God repented that he had fashioned the Adam on earth and was distraught. And he said, let me wipe the Adam that I have created off the face of the earth. The Sumerian and Akkadian texts telling the story of the deluge explain that the two gods were involved in that drama. It was Enlil who sought mankind's destruction by the deluge, while it was Enki who, conv- who connived to prevent it by instructing, quote-unquote, Noah to build the sa- salvaging ark. When we delve into the details, we find that Enlil's, I've had it up to here, anger on one hand, and Enki's counter-efforts on the other hand, were not just a matter of principles. For it was Enki himself who began to copulate with female earthlings and have children by them, and it was Marduk, Enki's son, who led the way to set the example for actual marriages with them. By the time their mission, Earth, was fully operative, the Anunnaki station on Earth numbered 600. In addition, 300 were known as the Agigi, those who observe and see. So those are the watchers. So. There we have a very uh, clear declination of, um, you know, because you see the Nephilim referred to in the Bible, you see the Watchers referred to, but the Watchers are actually these Agigi, and that's their job. That's those who observe and see. They don't do anything else but just observe and watch and document what's going on. Those are the ones that are referred to as the Watchers. They had planned a planetary way station on Mars and the spacecraft shuttling between the two planets. We know that Ninma, the Anunnaki's chief medical officer, came to Earth at the head of a group of female nurses. It is not stated how many they were, or whether they were there were other females among the Anunnaki, but it's clear that in any event, females were few among them. Well, that's okay. The Inky just went in his lab and whipped up some vag. He's like, fuck, there's hardly any women here. I mean, this is, this is a total sausage fest. We got to do something about this. Yeah, I'll just go in here and get my lab, whip up a little female there. Yeah, that's good. Mm, yes, let's pour some let's pour some seed into that real quick. The situation required strict sexual rules and supervision by the elders, so much so that according to one text, Enki and Ninma had to act as matchmakers decreeing who should marry whom. And Lil, a strict disciplinarian, himself felt fell victim to the shortage of females and date-raped a young nurse. Really, Zechariah? Really? You really got that much information? Did it really say that in the text? Did it really say that he date-raped her? I'd love to see that. I'd love to see that, 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 that translation. And Enki did slip his young victim a roofie, and he did slip her something else after that. <laughs> Hot beef injection. For that, even he, the commander-in-chief on Earth, was punished with exile. The punishment was commuted when he agreed to marry Sud and make her his official consort. Then Lil, she remained his sole spouse to the very end. Enki, on the other hand, is described in numerous texts as a philanderer with female goddesses of all ages managing to get away with it. Moreover, once daughters of the Adam proliferated, he was not adverse to having sexual flings with them. I mean, anything to get his dick wet, dude. Didn't matter. Animal, mineral, vegetable, he'd take it all. Siberian texts extolled Adapa, the wisest of men who grew up at Enki's household, was taught writing and mathematics by Enki, and was the first earthling to be taken aloft to visit Anu on Nibiru. 
The texts also reveal that Adapa was a secret son of Enki, mothered by an earthling female. Apocryphal texts inform us that when Noah, the biblical hero of the deluge, was born, much about the baby and the birth caused his father Lamech to wonder whether the real father had been one of the Nephilim. The Bible just states that Noah was a a genealogically perfect man who walked with the Elohim. That's great. Sumerian texts, uh, where the flood's hero is named Zisidro, suggest that he was a demigod son of Enki. It was thus that one day Marduk complained to his mother that while his companions were assigned wives, he was not. I have no wife, I have no children. And he went on to tell her that he had taken a liking to the daughter of a high priest, an accomplished musician. There is no reason to believe that he was the chosen man in Meteronchi of Sumerian text, the parallel of the biblical Enoch. Oh, there is reason to believe that he was. Okay. Verifying that the young earthling female, her name was Tisarpanet, agreed Marduk's parents gave him the go-ahead. The marriage produced a son. He was named Insag, lofty lord, but unlike Adapa, who was an earthling demigod, Marduk's son was included in the Sumerian god lists, where he was also called the Divine Mesh, a term used as in Gilgamesh to denote a demigod. He was thus the first demigod who was a god, and later on, when he held the, when he led the masses of humans in his father's behalf, he was given the epitaph name Nabu, the spokesman, the prophet. For that is what the literal meaning of the word is, as is the meaning of the parallel biblical Hebrew word, Nabi, translated prophet. Nabu was thus the godson and an Adam son of ancient scriptures, the one whose very name meant prophet, as in the Egyptian prophecies earlier quoted. His name and role became linked to the messianic expectations. Nabu was thus the godson and an Adam son of ancient scriptures, the one whose very name meant prophet, as in the Egyptian prophecies earlier quoted. His name and role became linked to the messianic expectations. And so it was in the days before the deluge that Marduk set an example to the other young unespoused gods. Find and marry an earthling female. The breach of the taboo appeal, appeal, appealed in particular to the Agigi gods, who were away on Mars most of the time, with their principal station on Earth being the landing place in the Cedar Mountains. Finding an opportunity, perhaps an invitation, to come and celebrate Marduk's wedding, they seized earthling females and carried them off as wives. Several extra-biblical books designated the Apocrypha, such as the Book of Jubilees, the Book of Enoch, and the Book of Noah, record the incident of the intermarriage by the Nephilim, and fill in the details. Some 200 watchers, those who observe and see, organized themselves in 20 groups. Each had a named leader. One called Shamyaza was in overall command. The instigator of the transgression, the one who led astray the sons of God and brought them down to earth and led them astray through the daughters of man, was named Yequan. It happened, these sources confirmed, during the time of Enoch. In spite of their efforts to fill the Sumerian sources that told of rival and contradicting Enlil and Enki into a monotheistic framework, the belief in only one almighty God, the compilers of the Hebrew Bible ended that section in chapter 6 of Genesis with a recognition of the factual outcome. Speaking of the offspring of those intermarriages, the Bible makes two admissions. The first, that the intermarrying took place in the days before the deluge, and thereafter too. And secondly, that from the offspring came the heroes of old, the men of renown. The Sumerian texts indicate that post-diluvial heroic kings were indeed such demigods. But they were the offspring not only of Enki and his clan, sometimes kings in the Enlilite region were sons of Enlilite gods. For example, the Sumerian king lists clearly state that when kingship began in Uruk, 
which was an Enlilite domain, the one chosen for kingship was Mesh, a demigod. Me Meshikashkar, a son of Utu, became high priest and king. Utu was, of course, the god Utu Shamash, grandson of Enlil. Further down the dynastic line, there was the, the famed Gilgamesh, two-thirds of him divine, son of the Enlilite goddess Ninsen, and fathered by the high priest of Uruk in Earthling. There were several more rulers down the line, both in Uruk and in Ur, who bore the title Mesh or Mes. In Egypt, too, some pharaohs claimed divine parentage. Many in the 18th and 19th dynasties adopted the theophoric names with a prefix or suffix, meaning issue of this or that god, such as the names of Amis or Ramses. ra -mazes. Oh, I see. So the first part of that name represents uh, that they are, you know, basically a precinct of that particular god. The famed Queen Hathsaput, who's who, though a female, sees the title and privileges of a pharaoh, claim that right that right by virtue of being a demigod. The great god Amon, she claimed in inscriptions and depictions in her immense temple at Deir el Bahari, took the form of his majesty the king. The husband of her queen mother had intercourse with her and caused Hatshepsut to be born as his semi-divine daughter. Canaanite texts include the tale of Karet, a king who was son of the god of El. An interesting variant on such demigod as king practices was the case of Inanna e Tatum. Uh, how do you say that? Uh, Inanna e Ian Natum? Iana Adam. Iana Adam. Okay. A Siberian king in Ninurta's Lagash during the early heroic times, an inscription by the king on a well-known monument of his Stella of the Vultures attributes his demigod status to artificial insemination by Ninurta, the lord of the Gershu, the sacred precinct, and to help form Inanna, Ishtar, and Ninma, here called by her epitaph Ninarshek. The Lord Ningershu, warrior of Enlil, implanted the semen of Enlil for Inanatum in the womb of blank. Oh, they don't tell us who he put it in the womb of. That's interesting. Inanna accompanied him with his birth and named him worthy in the Iana temple and set him on the sacred lap of Ninarsha. Ninarsha offered him her sacred breast. Ningershu rejoiced over Inanatum and semen implanted in her in the womb by Nigershu. I mean, it's every other term. There, I mean, you know, I mean, you wonder why people think that we were seated by these these people from these texts when in every other goddamn word it's fucking somebody's pouring somebody's semen into somebody or in, implanting it in there. I mean, really, our whole history. I mean, it's like they should just have a big book that just says fucking. The end. While the reference to the semen of Enlil leaves unclear whether Ninurta Nagershi's own semen is here considered the semen of Enlil because he was Enlil's firstborn or actually used semen of Enlil for the insemination, which is doubtful. The inscription clearly claims that Ian Tatum's mother, whose name is illegible on the Stella, was artificially impregnated so that a demigod was conceived without actual sexual intercourse. A case of immaculate conception in 3rd millennium BCE Samir. Yeah, well, again, what do you think Jesus was? That's why, I mean, they create, they, they, these were advanced people. You know, we're supposed to think in biblical times that, you know, yes, the regular people like us were, weren't advanced, but, I mean, my God, they, they, caused the birth of Jesus through their artificial insemination programs and caused this to be able to create the foundations for their control and religion permanently. That God, the gods were no strangers to artificial insemination is corroborated by Egyptian texts. According to which, after Seth killed and dismembered Osiris, the god Toth extracted semen from the phallus of Osiris and impregnated with it the wife of Osiris, Isis, 
bring about the birth of the god Horus. A depiction of the feet shows Toth and birth goddess holding the two strands of DNA that were used, and Isis holding the newborn Horus. Clearly, then, after the deluge, the Enlilites, too, accepted both the mating with the earthling females and considered the offspring heroes and men of renown, suitable for kingship. Royal bloodlines of demigods were thus begun, and those, of course, are the bloodlines that exist in positions of power to this day. They've never ended. Why do you think you have a place like Washington, D.C., just the whole thing's just littered with Egyptian and these old type of iconography. One of the first tasks of ur Namu was to carry out a moral and religious revival, and for that, too, a former revered and remembered king was emulated. It was done through the promulgation of a new code of laws, laws of moral behavior, laws of justice, of adherence. The code said to the laws that Enlil and Nanar and Shamash had wanted the king to enforce and the people to live by. The nature of the laws, a list of do's and don'ts, can be judged by ur Namu's claim that due to those laws of justice, the orphan did not fall prey to the wealthy, the widow did not fall prey to the powerful, the man with one sheep was not delivered to the man with one ox. Yeah, well, yeah, that's what you think. You hadn't seen our world. Look at our world, all those things happen all the time, every day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Justice was established in the land. In that, he emulated, sometimes using the exact same phrases as a previous Sumerian king, Uraka Gina of Lagash, who 300 years earlier had promulgated a law code by which social, legal, and religious reforms were instituted, among them the establishment of women's safe houses under the patronage of the goddess Bao, Ninurta's spouse. These, it ought to be pointed out, were the very same principles of justice and morality that the biblical prophets demanded of kings and people in the next millennium. As the era of Ur III began, there was obviously a deliberate attempt to return Samir, now Samir and Akkad, to its old days of glory, prosperity, and morality and peace, the times that preceded the latest confrontation with Marduk. The inscriptions, the monuments, and the archaeological, archaeological evidence attests that ur Nammu's reign, which began in 2113 BCE, witnessed extensive public works, restoration of river navigation, and the rebuilding and protection of the country's highways. He made the highways run from the lower lands to the upper lands, an inscription stated. Greater trade and commerce followed. There was a surge in arts, crafts, schools, and other improvements in social and economic life, including the introduction of more accurate weights and measures. Treaties with neighboring rulers to the east and northeast spread the prosperity and well-being. The great gods, especially Enlil and Ninlil, were honored with renovated and magnified temples. And for the first time in Samir's history, the priesthood of Ur was combined with that of Nippur, leading a religious revival. All the scholars agree that in virtually every way, the Ur the Third period, begun by ur Namu, attained new heights in the Sumerian civilization. That conclusion only increased the puzzlement caused by a beautifully crafted box that was uncovered by archaeologists. Its inlaid panels, front and back, depicted two contradicting scenes of life in Ur, while one of the panels, now known as the Peace Panel, depicted banqueting, commerce, and other scenes of civil activities. The other, the War Panel, depicted a military column of armed and helmeted soldiers and horse-drawn chariots marching to war. A close examination of the records from that time reveals that, indeed, while under the leadership of ur Namu, Samir itself flourished. The hostility of the Inalites by the rebel hands increased rather than diminished. The situation apparently demanded action, for according to ur Namu's inscriptions, Enlil gave him a divine weapon that heaps up the rebels in piles with which to attack the hostile lands, destroy the evil cities, and clear them of opposition. Yeah, that's a nuke. Those rebel lands and sinning cities were west of Sumer, the lands of Marduk's Amorite followers. There, the evil and the hostility against Enlil was fanned by Nabu, who moved about from city to city proselytizing for Marduk. Enlilite records called him the oppressor, of whose influence the sinning cities had to be rid. 
There is reason to believe that the peace and war panels actually depicted Ur Namu himself, one showing him banqueting and celebrating peace and prosperity, the other in the royal chariot leading his army to war. His military expeditions took him well beyond Sumir's borders into the western lands. But Ur Namu, great reformer, builder, and economic shepherd that he was, failed as a military leader. In the midst of battle, his chariot got stuck in the mud. Ur Namu fell off of it, but the chariot, like a storm, rushed along, leaving the king behind, abandoned like a crushed jug. The tragedy was compounded when the boat returning Ur Namu's body to Sumir had sunk in an unknown place, and the waves sank it down with him on, on, on board. That dude was just born fucked, sounds like to me. Uh, good God. When news of the defeat and the tragic death of Ur Namu reached Ur, a great lament went up there. The people could not understand how such a religiously devout king, a righteous shepherd who only followed the gods' directives with weapons they put in his hands, could perish so ignominiously. Why did the Lord Denar not hold him by the hand, they asked. Why did Anana, Lady of Heaven, not put her noble arm around his head? Why did the valiant Utu not assist him? The Sumerians who believed that all that happens had been fated wondered, why did these gods step aside when ur bitter fate was decided? Surely those gods, Nanur and his twin children, knew what Anu and Enlil were determining. Yet they said nothing to protect ur -Namu. There could be only one plausible explanation. The people of Ur and Sumir concluded as they cried out and lamented, the great gods must have gone back on their word. How the fate of the hero had been changed. Anu altered his holy word. Enlil deceitfully changed his decree. Ah, so now we're starting to see a shift, a schism between the, the gods and, uh, and the humans. And uh, I suspect this is where where a lot of this, I think this is probably where, and maybe we'll find that out in this book. That's my intent of reading this book. But I have a feeling that's where um, Sitchin and others have pulled this, uh, you know, return to the Anunnaki stuff from. I think that they have, that they believe from these texts that, um, you know, they're going to come back and there's going to be that schism between man again and, and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, I, I flatly just don't agree with that because, well, I mean, it, as we've been reading here, I mean, the stuff we've read here tonight and in other readings that we've done, you know, the, the people that are in charge to this day are the proxies of these people. So, you know, um, I, I really don't see how it would be any different. Well, they're, they're going to come down here. It sounds to me like they're running the, the, the show. I mean, these are the bloodlines, right? They're running the show the same way the people that are running the show are now. They're just their underlings. Uh, management hasn't been in the building for several thousand years, and uh, I guess they're saying that, you know, I guess eventually management's going to return. And take over the show themselves. Uh, but um, <laughs> you know, I yeah, I, I don't I don't believe that. But we'll, who knows? I mean, I'm not saying it's not possible. I could be completely wrong. But um, you know, I don't know. Maybe the the, the, the the land will flow with the blood of the unbelievers. These are strong words accusing the great Enlilite gods of deceit and double crossing. The ancient words convey the extent of the people's disappointment. If that was so in Samir and Akkad, one can imagine the reaction in the rebellious western lands. In the struggle for the hearts and minds of mankind, the Inlilites were faltering. Nabu, the spokesman, intensified the campaign on behalf of his father Marduk. His own status was enhanced and changed. His own divinity was now glorified by a variety of venerating epitaphs. Inspired by Nabu, the Nabi, the prophet, prophecies of the future of what is about to happen began to sweep the contested lands. We know, we know what they said because a number of clay tablets on which such prophecies were inscribed have been found. Written in old Babylonian cuneiform, they are grouped by scholars as Akkadian prophecies of, or Akkadian apocalypses. 
Common to all of them is the view that the past, present, and future are parts of a continuous flow of events. That within a preordained destiny, there is some room for free will, and thus a variated fate. That for mankind, both were decreed or determined by the gods of heaven and earth, and that therefore events on earth reflect occurrences in the heavens. To grant the prophecy's believability, the text sometimes anchored the prediction of future events in a known past historic occurrence or entity. What is wrong in the present, why change is needed, is then recounted. The unfolding events are attributed to decisions by one or more of the great gods. A divine emissary, a herald, will appear. The prophetic text might be his words, written down by the scribe, or expected pronouncements, as often as not. A son will speak for his father. The predicted events will be linked to omens. The death of a king or heavenly signs. A celestial body will appear and make a frightful sound. A burning fire will come from the skies. A star shall flash from the height of the sky to the horizon as a torch, and most significantly, a planet will appear before its time. Bad things, apocalypse, shall precede the final event. There would be calamitous rains, huge devastating waves or droughts, the silting of canals, locusts, and famines. Mother will turn against daughter, neighbor against neighbor, rebellion, chaos, calamities will occur in the lands. Cities will be attacked and depopulated, dogs and cats living together. No, I'm kidding. Uh, kings will die, be toppled and captured. One throne will overthrow another. Right, well, that's what their official historical record says happened on their planet. So they fucked everything up on their planet and came down here and set up shop and fucked everything up, created us, and made us live in a fucked up world. That's nice of them. They don't want to be the only sods in the universe living in a fucked up ass, retarded world. Well, thank you. We want other people to live in a fucked up ass, retarded world, too. Officials and priests will be killed, temples will be abandoned, rites and offerings will cease, and then the predicted event, a great change, a new era, a new leader, a redeemer will come. Good will prevail over evil, prosperity will replace sufferings, abandoned cities will be resettled, the remnants of the dispersed people will return to their homes, temples will be restored, and the people will perform the correct religious rites. Not unexpectedly, these Babylonian or pro-Marduk prophecies pointed the accusing finger of wrongdoing at Samir and Akkad, and also their allies, Elam, Hadaland, and the Sea Lands, and named the Amaru Westerners as the instrument of divine retribution. The Inlilite cult centers, Nippur, Ur, Aruk, Larasa, Lagash, Sippar, and Adab, are named. They will be attacked, plundered, their temples abandoned. The Enlilite gods are described as confused, unable to sleep. Enlil is calling out to Anu, but ignores Anu's advice. That Enlil issues a Misharu, an edict, of putting things straight order. Enlil, Ishtar, and Adad will be forced to change kingship in Samir and Akit. The sacred rites will be transferred out of Nippur. Celestially, the great planet will appear in the constellation of the Ram. The word of Marduk shall prevail. He will subdue the four regions. The whole earth shall tremble at the mention of his name. After him, his sons will reign as king and will become master of the whole earth. In some of the prophecies, certain deities are the subject of specific predictions. A king will arise, one text prophesied in regard to Anana Ishtar. He will remove the protective goddess of Aruk from Aruk and will make her dwell in Babylon. He will establish the rights of Anu in Aruk. The Agigi are also specifically mentioned. The regular offerings for the Agigi gods, which had ceased, will be reestablished, one prophecy states. As was the case with the Egyptian prophecies, most scholars also treat the Akkadian prophecies as pseudo-prophecies or post-eventum texts. That they were, in fact, written long, long after the predicted events, but as we have remarked in regards to the Egyptian text, to say that the events were not prophesied because they had already happened is only to reassert that the events per se did happen, whether or not they were predicted. And that, and that is what matters most to us. It means that the prophecies did come true. And if so, most chilling is the prediction in, in a text known as Prophecy B. The awesome weapon of error upon the lands of the people will come in judgment. A most chilling prophecy indeed, for 
before the 21st century BCE was over, judgment upon the lands and peoples occurred when the god Era, the Annihilator, an epitaph for Nurgle, unleashed nuclear weapons in a cataclysm that made prophecies come true. So that's the end of chapter four. The next chapter is chapter five, Countdown to Doomsday. We'll get into that next time. And here we go. Chapter five, Countdown to Doomsday. Uh-oh. Sounds like it's going to get interesting now, huh? The disastrous 21st century BCE began with the tragic and untimely death of Ur Namu in 2096 BCE. It culminated with an unparalleled calamity by the hand of the gods themselves. In 2024 BCE, the interval was 72 years, exactly the processional shift of one degree. And if it was just a coincidence, then it was one of a series of coincidental occurrences that were somehow well coordinated. Following ur tragic death, the throne of Ur was taken over by his son Shugli, uh, Shulgi. Unable to claim the status of a demigod, he asserted in his inscriptions that he was nevertheless born under divine auspices. The god Nenar himself arranged for the child to be conceived in Enlil's temple in Nippur through a union between ur and Enlil's high priestess so that a little Enlil, a child suitable for kingship and throne, shall be conceived. That was a genealogical claim not to be sneezed at. Erd Emu himself, as earlier stated, it was two-thirds divine, since his mother was a, was a goddess. Though the high priestess who was Shulgi's mother is not named, her very status suggests that she too was of some godly lineage, for it was a king's daughter who was chosen to be in two and the kings of Ur, starting with the first dynasty, could be traced back to the demigods. That Nanar himself arranged for the union to take place in Enlil's temple in Nippur was also significant. As previously stated, it was under ur Nemu's reign that for the first time the priesthood of Nippur was combined with the priesthood of another city, in this case, with the one in Ur. Much of what was happening in and around Sumer at the time has been gleaned from the date formulas Royal records in which each year of the king's reign was noted by the major event that year. In the case of Shulgi, much more is known, for he left behind other short and long inscriptions, including poetry and love songs. These records indicate that soon after he had ascended the throne, Shulgi, perhaps hoping to avert his father's fate on a battlefield, reversed his father's militant policies. He launched an expedition to the outlying provinces, including the rebel lands, but his weapons were often made of trade, peace, and his daughters in marriage. Deeming himself to be a successor to Gilgamesh, his route embraced the two destinations of that famed hero, the Sinai Peninsula, where the spaceport was, in the south, in the landing place in the north. Observing the sanctity of the fourth region, Shulgi skirted the peninsula and paid homage to the gods at its boundaries at a place described as a great fortified place of the gods. Moving northward west of the Dead Sea, he paused to worship at the place of bright oracles, the place we know as Jerusalem, and built there an altar to the god who judges, usually an epitaph of Utu or Shamash. At the snow-covered place in the north, he built an altar and offered sacrifices. Having thus touched base with the reachable space-related sites, he followed the Fertile Crescent, the arching trade and migration, east-west route dictated by geography and water sources, then continued southward in the Tigris-Euphrates plain back to the southern Samir. When Shulgi returned to Ur, he had every reason to think that he had brought to gods and people alike peace in our time. To use a modern analogy, he was granted by the gods the title High Priest of Anu, Prince, Priest of Nanar. He was befriended by Utu, Shamash, and was given the personal attention of Ishtar, boasting in his love songs that she granted him her vulva in her temple. <laughs> this fool wrote a love song about Ishtar granting him her vulva. I'm going to start using that. Uh, excuse me. Uh, excuse me, miss. Yes, uh, I was just wondering if... Uh, if you would uh, mind uh, granting me your vulva, that'd be fantastic. Thank you very much.
You just be really polite about this. You know, instead of walking up, give me some ass, bitch. Rolling, but yeah, so I was just wondering if you would grant me your vulva. Thank you. You know what grant means? That means you don't have to give it back. But while Shulgi turned from affairs of state to personal pleasures, the unrest in rebel hands was continuing. Unprepared for military action, Shulgi asked his Elamite ally for troops, offering its king as a reward for one of his daughters in marriage and the Sumerian city Larsa as a dowry. A major military expedition employing those Elamite troops was launched against the sinning cities in the west. The troops reached the fortified place of the gods at the fourth region's boundary. Shulgi and his inscriptions boasted of victory, but in fact, soon thereafter, he started to build a fortified wall to protect Samir against foreign incursions from the west and from the northwest. The date formulas called it the Great West Wall, and scholars believe that it ran from the Euphrates to the Tigris rivers north of where Baghdad is situated now. Oh, where did I leave off? Uh, the date formulas called it the Great West Wall, and scholars believe that it ran from the Euphrates to the Tigris rivers north of where Baghdad is situated nowadays, blocking to invaders the way down the fertile plain between the two rivers. It was a defensive measure that preceded the Great Wall of China, which was built for similar reasons almost 2,000 years ago. See, now that's, that's very interesting. The idea of building these fortified walls. Um, and, uh, you know, that very well could be what some of these structures like the Rock Wall are. In 2048 BC, I mean, my God, they found giants, giant skeletons around these things. Give me a break. In 2048 BC, Eve, the gods led by Enlil had enough of Shulgi state failures and personal Dolce Vita, determining the divine regulations he did not carry out. They decreed for him the death of a sinner. We do not know what kind of death it was, but it is a historic fact that in that year he was replaced on the throne of Ur by his son, Amar Sin, of whom we know from the inscriptions that he launched one military expedition after another to quell a revolt in the north to fight an alliance of five kings in the west. As in so much else, what was happening had root causes going back, sometimes way back to earlier times and events. The rebel lands, though in Asia and thus dominate domains in the Inlite lands of Noah's son Shem, were inhabited by varied Canaanites, offspring of the biblical Canaan, who, though descended of Ham and thus belonging to Africa, occupied a stretch of Shem's lands that the lands of the West along the Mediterranean coast were somehow disputed territory, and also indicated by ancient Egyptian texts regarding the bitter contest between Horus and Seth that ended in aerial battles between them over the Sinai and the same contested lands. It is noteworthy that in their military expeditions to subdue and punish the rebel lands in the west, both ur Namu and Shulgi reached the Sinai Peninsula, but turned away from that fourth region without entering it. The prize there was a place called Tilman, the place of the missiles, the site of the post-diluvial spaceport of the Anunnaki. When the Pyramid Wars ended, the Sacred Fourth Region was entrusted to the neutral hands of Ninma, who was then renamed Ninarshag, Lady of the Mountain Peaks. But actual command of the spaceport was put in the hands of Utu, Shamash, here shown in a winged dress uniform, commanding the spaceport's eaglemen. That, however, appeared to change as the struggle for supremacy intensified. Inexplicably, various Sumerian texts and god lists started to associate Tilman with Marduk's son, the god Insag Nabu. Enki was apparently involved in that for a text dealing with the affair between Enki and Anarchic states, but the two of them decided to allocate the place to Marduk's son. Let Insag be the lord of Tilman, they said. The ancient sources indicate that from the safety of the sacred region, Nabu ventured to the lands of cities along the Mediterranean coast, even to some Mediterranean islands, spreading everywhere the message of Marduk's coming supremacy. He was thus the enigmatic sun man of the Egyptian and of the Akkadian prophecies, the divine son who was also a sun man, the son of a god and of an earthling woman. 
The In the Lights, understandably, could not accept such a situation, and so it was that when Amar Sin ascended to the throne of Ur after Shulgi, the targets and strategy of the Ur Third military expeditions were changed in order to reassert In the Light control over Tilman. To sever the sacred region from the rebel lands, then pry loose the lands from the influence of Naboo and Marduk by force of arms. Starting in 2047 BCE, the sacred fourth region became a target in a pawn in the Enlilite struggle with Marduk and Naboo. And as both biblical and Mesopotamian texts reveal, the conflict erupted to the greatest international world war of antiquity, involving the Hebrew Abraham. That war of the kings placed him in center stage of international events. In 2048 BCE, the destiny of the founder of monotheism, Abraham, and the fate of the Anunnaki god Marduk converged in a place called Haran. Haran, the cavernary, was an important trading center from time immemorial in Haiti, the land of the Hittites. It was located at the crossroads of major international trade and military land routes. Situated at the headwaters of the Euphrates River, it was also a hub of river transportation all the way downstream to Ur itself. Surrounded by fertile meadows watered by the river's tributaries, the Balak and Kabur rivers, it was a center of shepherding. The famed merchants of Ur came there for Haran's wool and bought in exchange, brought in exchange to distribute from their Ur's famed woolen garments. Commerce in metals, skins, leather, woods, earthenware, products, and spices followed. The prophet Ezekiel, who was exiled from Jerusalem to the Kabar area in Babylonian times, mentioned Haran's merchants in choice fabrics and embroidered cloaks of blue and many colored carpets. Haran, the town by that very name, still exists in Turkey near the border with Syria and was visited by me, Zechariah Sitchin, in 1997. It was also known in ancient times as Ur, away from Ur. At its center stood a great temple to Nanar Sin. In 2095 BCE, the year in which Shulgi took over the throne in Ur, a priest named Tara was sent to Ur for, to Haran to serve at the temple. He took along his family. It included his son Abram. We know about Tara, his family, and their move from Ur to Hanan from the Bible. It was with these verses from the Hebrew Bible begins the pivotal tale of Abraham called at the beginning by his Sumerian name, Abram. His father, we are told, earlier stemmed from a patriarchal line that went all the way back to Shem, the oldest son of Noah, the hero of the deluge. All those patriarchs enjoyed long lives, Shem to the age of 600, his son, Aparkashad, to 438, and subsequent male offspring to 433, 460 years, 239 years, and 230 years. Nahor, the father of Terah, lived to age 148. And Terah himself, who fathered Abram when he was, his, was 70 years old, lived to age 205. Chapter 11 of Genesis explains that Aparkashad and his descendants lived in the lands later known as Samir and Elam and their surroundings. So Abraham, as Abram, was a true Sumerian. Imagine that. That's where do you think the God's chosen people thing comes from, folks? <laughs> The genealogical information alone indicates that Abraham was of a special ancestry. His Sumerian name, Abram, Abram meant father's beloved, an appropriate name for a son finally born to a 70-year-old father. The father's name, Terah, stemmed from the Sumerian epithet name, Tiru. It designated an oracle priest, a priest who observed celestial signs or received oracle messages from a god and explained or conveyed them to the king. The name of Abram's wife, Sari, like Sarah in Hebrew, meant princess. The name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, meant queen-like. Both suggest a royal genealogy. Since it was later revealed that Abraham's wife was his half-sister, the daughter of my father but not of my mother, he explained, it follows that Sari, Sarah's mother, was of royal descent. The family thus belonged to Samir's highest echelons, combining royal and priestly ancestries. Ah, see, that's a, that's a key thing to understand about these bloodlines and why they're important. 
You hear that? The combining of royal and priestly ancestries. So you have the priest class over here and the keepers of the, the ancient knowledge. And then the royals over here are the blue bloods. And then you put those together and boom, that's where you set up these, this hereditary dictatorship, the divine right to rule. Another significant clue to identifying the family's history is the repeated reference by Abraham to himself when he met rulers in Canaan in Egypt. As being a Hebrew, a Hebrew, the word stems from the root abor, to come across or to cross, so it has been assumed by biblical scholars that that meant that he had come across from the other side of the Euphrates River from Mesopotamia. But I believe that the term was more specific. The name used for Sumer's version of Vatican City, Nippur, is the Akkadian rendering of the original Sumerian name, Nibiru, Splendid Place of the Crossing. Well, that's interesting. Abram and his descendants, who were called in the Hebrew in the Bible Hebrews, belonged to a family that identified themselves as the Hebrew, Nippurians. That would suggest that Terah was first a priest in Nippur, then moved to Ur, and finally to Haran, taking his family along. By synchronizing biblical Sumerian and Egyptian chronologies, we have arrived at the year 2123 BCE as the date of Abraham's birth. The gods' decision to make Nanar Sin's cult, culture center, Ur, the capital of Sumeria, to a throne, ur Namu, took place in 2113 BCE. Soon thereafter, the priesthoods of Nippur and Ur were combined for the first time. It's very likely that it was then that the Nippurian priest, Tir Tirhu, moved with his family, including the 10-year-old boy, Abram, to serve in Nanar's temple in Ur. In 2095 BCE, when Abraham was 28 and already married, Terah was transferred to Haran, taking the family with him. It could not have been just a coincidence that it was the very same year in which Shulgi succeeded Ur Namu. This emerging scenario is that the movements of this family were somehow linked to the geopolitical events of that era, just like it is now. Indeed, when Abraham himself was chosen to carry out divine orders to leave Haran and rush to Canaan, the great god Marduk took the crucial step of moving to Haran. It was in 2048 BCE that the two moves occurred, Marduk coming to sojourn, sojourn in Haran and Abraham leaving Haran for faraway Canaan. We know from Genesis that Abraham was 75 years old, and thus it was 2048 BCE that he was told by God, Get thee out of thy country and out of thy birthplace and from thy father's house. Leave behind Samir, Nippur, and Haran and go. Go into the land in which I will show thee. As to Marduk, a long text known as the Marduk prophecy that he addressed to the people of Haran provides the clue confirming the fact and the time of his move to Haran as 2048 BCE. There is no way those two moves could have been unrelated. But 2048 B.C. was also the very year in which the Enlilite gods decided to get rid of Shulgi, ordering for him the death of a sinner, a move that signaled the end of the let's try peaceful means and a return to aggressive conflict. And there is no way that this, too, was just a coincidence. No, the three moves, Marduk to Haran, Abram leaving Haran for Canaan, and the removal of the decadent Shulgi had to be interconnected. Three simultaneous and interrelated moves in the Divine Chess Game. All right. The ensuing 24 years from 2048 to 2024 BCE were a time of religious fervor, ferment of international diplomacy and intrigue of military alliances and clashing armies, of a struggle for strategic superiority. The spaceport in the Sinai Peninsula and the other space-related sites were constantly at the core of events. Amazingly, various written records from antiquity have survived, providing us not just with an outline of events, but with great details about the battles, the strategies, the discussions, the arguments, the participants, and their moves and the crucial decisions that resulted in the most profound upheaval on Earth since the deluge. 
Augmented by the date formulas and varied other references, the principal sources for reconstructing those dramatic events are the relevant chapters in Genesis. Marduk's autobiography, known as the Marduk Prophecy, a group of tablets in the Spartoli collection in the British Museum known as the Kedorla Omar texts, and a long historical audio autobiographical text dictated by the god Nurgle to a trusted scribe in a text known as the Era Epos. As in a movie, usually a crime thriller in which the various eyewitnesses and principals describe the same event, not exactly the same way, but from which the real story emerges, so we're able to reach the same result in this case. Marduk's main chess move in 2048 BCE was to establish his command post in Haran. By that, he took away from Nanar Sin his vital northern crossroads and severed Samir from the northern lands to the Hittites. Besides the military significance, the move deprived Sumir of its economically vital commercial ties. The move also enabled Nabu to marshal his cities toward the Great Sea to set his course. Place names in these texts suggest that the principal cities west of the Euphrates River were coming under full or partial control of the father-son team, including the all-important landing place. It was into the most populated part of the lands of the west, Canaan, that Abraham, Abraham was commanded to go. He left Haran, taking his wife and nephew Lot with him. He was traveling swiftly southward, stopping only to pay homage to his god at selected sacred sites. His destination was the Negev, the dry region bordering the Sinai Peninsula. He did not stay there long. As soon as Shugli's successor, Amar Sin, was enthroned in Ur in 2047 BCE, Abram was instructed to go to Egypt. He was at once taken to meet the reigning pharaoh and was provided with sheep and oxen and asses and male attendants and female servants and she asses and camels. Well, you just said he had female servants. You didn't have to say he had she asses. I mean, we, we, we get it. Oh, she donkeys. I'm sorry. I just never heard the term she asses before. Let's go get some she-ass, gentlemen. The Bible is mum regarding the reason for this royal treatment, except a hint that the Pharaoh, being told that Sarai was Abram's sister, assumed that she was being offered to him in marriage, a step that suggests that a treaty was discussed, that such high-level international negotiations were taking place between Abram and the Egyptian king seems plausible, when one realizes that the year when Abram returned to the Negev after a seven-year stay in Egypt, 2040 BCE, was the very same year in which the Theban princesses of the Theban princes of Upper Egypt defeated the previous Lower Egypt dynasty, launching Egypt's unified Middle Kingdom. Another geopolitical coincidence. Abram, now reinforced with manpower and camels, returned to the Negev in the nick of time. His mission now clear to defend the fourth region with its spaceport. As the biblical narrative reveals, he now had with him an elite force of Nerim, a term usually translated to young men. But Mesopotamian texts use the parallel term lunar, narmen, to denote armed cavalrymen. It is my suggestion that Abraham, having learnt in Haran tactics for the military excelling Hittites, obtained in Egypt a striking force of swift camel-riding cavalrymen. His base in Canaan was again the Negev, the area bordering, bordering the Sinai Peninsula. He did so in the nick of time for a mighty army. Legions of an alliance of Enlight kings was on its way, not only to crush and punish the sinning cities that switched allegiance to other gods, but also to capture the spaceport. The Sumerian text dealing with the reign of Amar Sin, Shulgi's son and successor, inform us that in 2041 BCE he launched his greatest and last military expedition against the lands of the West that fell under the Marduk Nabu spell. It entailed an inv invasion of unparalleled scope by an international alliance in which not only cities of men, but also strongholds of gods and their offspring were attacked. It was indeed such a major and unparalleled occurrence that the Bible devoted a whole long chapter, chapter to it. Genesis chapter 14. 
Biblical scholars call it the War of the Kings, for it climaxed in a great battle between an army of four kings of the east and the combined forces of five kings of the west, and culminated in a remarkable military feat by Abraham's swift cavalrymen. The Bible begins its report of that great international war by listing the kings and kingdoms of the east who came and made war in the west. And it came to pass in the days of Aramphal, king of Shinar, Arioka, king of Elisar, Kedora, Omar, king of Elam, and Tidehal, the king of Goyim. The tablets named the Kedora Mar text was first brought to scholarly attention by Assyriologist Theosophilus Pinches in a lecture at the Victoria Institute, London, in 1897. They clearly describe the same events that are the great international war of chapter 14 of Genesis, though in much greater detail. It is quite possible indeed that those tablets served as the source for the biblical writers. Those tablets identify Kedorla Omer, king of Elam, as the Elamite king Kudor Langamar, who is known from historical records as Arioka and has been identified as Ariaku, the servant of the moon god who reigned in the city of Larsa and Tidal and was identified as Tud Gula, a vassal of the king of Elam. There has been over the years a debate regarding the identity of the Aphoramal king of Shinar. Suggestions ranged all the way from Hammurabi, a Babylonian king centuries later. Shinar was the constant biblical name for Sumer, not Babylon. So who in the time of Abraham was its king? I have convincingly suggested in the wars of gods and men that the Hebrew should be read not Amara fell, but Amar fell from the Sumerian Amar Paul and variant of Amar Sin, whose date formulas attest that he did indeed in 2041 BCE launch the War of the Kings. The fully identified coalition, according to the Bible, was led by the Elamites a detail corroborated by the Mesopotamian data that highlights the re-emerging leading role of Ninurta in the struggle. The Bible also dates this Cladora omer invasion by observing that it took place 14 years after the previous Elamite incursion into Canaan, another detail confirming to the data from Shulgi's time. The invasion route this time was, however, different, shortcutting the distance from Mesopotamia by a risky passage through a stretch of desert. The invaders avoided the densely populated Mediterranean coastland by marching on the eastern side of the Jordan River. The Bible lists the places where those battles took place and who the Enlilite forces were that battled there. The information indicates that an attempt was made to settle accounts with old adversaries, descendants of the intermarrying Igigi, even the usurper of Zu, who evidently supported the uprisings against the Enlilites. But sight was not lost of the prime target, the spaceport. The invading forces followed what was known as, that has been known since biblical times, as the Way of the King, running north south on the eastern side of the Jordan. But when they turned westward toward the gateway to the Sinai Peninsula, they met a blocking force Abraham and his cavalrymen. Referring to the peninsula's gateway city, Durma Elani, the god's great fortified place, the Bible called it, Kadesh Barnea, the Kadora Omer text clearly stated that the way was blocked there. The son of the priest, anointed by the gods, I suggest, was Abram, the son of the priest Terah. A date formula tablet belonging to Amar Sin inscribed on both sides boasts of destroying Nebiram, the shepherding place of Iburam. In fact, at the gateway to the spaceport, there was no battle. The mere presence of Abram's cavalry striking force persuaded the invaders to turn away to richer and more lucrative targets. But if the reference is indeed to Abraham by name, it offers once more an extraordinary extra-biblical corroboration of the patriarchal record, no matter who claimed victory. Prevented from entering the Sinai Peninsula, the army of the east turned northward. The Dead Sea was then shorter. It was current. Its current southern appendix was not yet submerged. And it was then a fertile plain rich with farmland, orchards, and trading centers. 
The settlements there included five cities, among them the infamous Sodom and Gomorrah. Turning northward, the invaders now faced the combined forces of what the Bible called five sinning cities. It was there, the Bible reports, that the four kings fought and defeated the five kings, looting the cities and taking captives with them. The invaders marched back, this time on the western side of Jordan. The biblical focus on these battles might have ended with that turning back were it not for the fact that Abraham's nephew Lot, who resided in Sodom, was among the captives. When a refugee from Sodom told Abraham what happened, he armed his trained men, 318 of them, and gave chase. His cavalry caught up with the invaders all the way north near Damascus, where Lot was freed and the booty recovered. He said booty. They recovered the booty. Yeah, well, Forget what happened a lot. Make sure you get that booty. The Bible records the feat as the smiting of Kedorah Omer and the kings who were with him by Abraham. The historical records suggest that as audacious and far-flung as that war of the kings had been, it failed to surpass the marduk Nabu surge. Amar Sin, we know, died in 2039 BCE, felled not by an enemy lance, but by a scorpion's bite. He was replaced in 2038 BCE by his brother Shusin. The data for his nine-year reign record two military forays northward, but none westward. They speak mostly of his defensive measures. He relied mainly on building new sections of the Wall of the West against attacking Amorites. The defenses, however, were moved each time ever closer to Samir's heartlands, and the territory controlled from Ur kept shrinking. By the time the next and last of the Ur the Third Dynasty, Ibibi Sin ascended to the throne, invaders from the west had broken through the defensive wall and were clashing with Ur's foreign legion. Uh, I'm sorry, they were clashing with Ur's foreign legion Elamite troops in Sumerian territory. Targeting and prompting the westerners on toward the cherished target was Nabu. His divine father, Marduk himself, was waiting in Haran for the recapture of Babylon. And, of course, we know Marduk is Ra, and Ra just wanted to rule everything. The great gods called to an emergency council, then approved extraordinary steps that changed the future forever. So that's the uh, end of chapter 5. The next chapter we'll start on tomorrow is Gone with the Wind.